Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to Turnips Digest again, Saturday morning, 8 o'clock a.m. on the dot. Uh, I am joined today by a very uh, a very full panel. Um, it's been a while since we've had uh, three other people on. I think it's been, you know, over a month. Um, so I'm joined uh, by my uh, lovely regular Panama hat. How are you, sir? Uh, I'm doing very well, thank you. Uh, as you can hear, my nose is stuffed up for no real reason. Um, it's just how it is here. It's the damp and the Welsh, uh, Welsh embrocature, uh getting its getting its way up my nose. Um, but yes, other than that, I'm fine, and I'm very much looking forward to the stream, in which I will most likely be taking a pretty a pretty solid back seat. Um, but, um, I I know the the outline of the Scottish Reformation leading up to the Bishops' Wars. Um, but it's the Bishop's Wars themselves that I know the most detail about, so I can probably come in there. Um, I'll, I'll, I'm the only representative of uh, the Roman Church here today, I believe. Um, yeah. But yeah. Uh, and uh, I'm being being hardly a qualified theologian. Um, I hope I don't do too bad a job of uh, representing the Catholic uh, Catholic position here, but I will do my best. Right, yeah. Um, I too am, uh, well, I say too, you didn't necessarily uh, explicitly mention it. I'm uh, plagued by allergies right now. I get, I, uh, I'm allergic to about one thing on this planet, and it is a type of weed that grows by uh, bodies of water right here in Oklahoma. So uh, this is the time of year that it starts to uh, just take off. Um, not fully there yet, so my voice is uh, still intact. And then on the other note, um, yes, representing the Catholic Church, um, you know, I was mildly worried that this could devolve into back and forth, and then I realized, you know, we could just structure this correctly, and uh, given the personalities here, uh, I I imagine everything will be fine. Uh, I, I don't foresee any particular uh, arguments, really, uh, mostly just a normal discussion. Um, I am also joined by uh, Mr. Nathan C.J. Hood. How are you, sir? I'm doing well, thank you. All the leaves are coming off the trees at the moment, so the pollen's gone, and uh, I'm quite glad about that. Um, Very good. And I, I will try to restrain my inner John Knox today, just for you, Brian. <laughs> right, so, um, and this was the other thing uh, that I used to sort of, uh, you know, console myself, a, a more harsh word would be cope. Uh, you know, if, uh, if we did have a back and forth, I am, I feel like I could play the neutral arbiter role, being as I am a you know, neither of the sides in the Scottish Reformation. So, um, that being said, uh, <clears throat> let me see. This is actually uh, quite pertinent to something that you just did on your own channel, uh, Nathan. Uh, you went over Charles III swearing to protect the Protestant religion in Scotland. Uh, before we uh, finish introductions, maybe you might want to just give a brief shout out to that before we start. Yeah, certainly. Thanks. So, uh, essentially, uh, the accession ceremony for Charles III happened uh, a few days ago, and it's basically the the marking of the monarch to, uh, supporting the British Constitution. And within that, there's an oath to promise to protect the independence of the Church of Scotland. And it's the only kind of religious oath that you find within the ceremony. So I thought about trying to explain why it, it, it's important. And some of the issues that we'll be covering today to do with uh, uh, Presbyterianism and Episcopalianism and their relationship or perceived relationship to Catholicism play into this. Uh, and uh, yeah, so we'll probably touch on some of the reasons as we go through. Wonderful. Very wonderful. And that's uh, part of why I'm uh, happy that this stream timed out the way it did, um, because I also saw that uh, that specific ceremony. And uh, I was probably just as flabbergasted as most other people, especially with the different takes coming out of different mm. denominations saying that a uh, Charles III was a razor thin edge away from converting to X denomination. Uh, I saw that all over the place. Uh, so, yeah, I, it caught my interest. And last but certainly not least, we are joined by Mr. Grant Brooks. How are you, sir? Uh, doing well. Good morning to you all. Glad to be here. Very good. Very good. And uh, Mr. Brooks, you are going to be providing a lot of the uh, structure and background and, you know, I'm so sure probably a majority of detail, um, you know, maybe split half and half with uh, Mr. Hood here. Uh, so sounds like you've got something very nicely planned out for us today. Yeah. So I'm going to run us basically from the beginnings of the independence of the Scottish church through the Reformation Parliament, and then more or less hand it off to uh, 
to Mr. Hood. All righty. So um, with that all being said, we have a lot of information to uh, run through. Uh, obviously, um, you know, we're not going to arbitrarily cap this at time. We go until, you know, people have to go uh, like usual. But I would like to get through this information. Um, I don't want to uh, wait and I don't want to tell uh, Mr. Brooks and Mr. Hood here that their uh, massive amount of preparation was for naught. So uh, without any further ado, uh, Grant Brooks, you are going to start uh, educating uh, me and uh, potentially Hat. Uh, sounds like he's in the same boat based off of uh, what I was talking about, though I'm probably much more ignorant than this. I, uh, give us the uh, history lesson. We will stop at a uh, natural breaking point in the discussion. And uh, in typical fashion on the stream, we will just discuss the points, provide background, you know, draw connections to other points in history and whatnot. Um, you know, very sort of uh, uh, informal, if you will. But anyways, Mr. Brooks, please take it away. All righty. So, you know, you could start this off with the conversion of the Scots in the 6th century. They're mostly converted by native or Irish Scots missionaries rather than ones from Rome or England. Uh, I don't have much information on that. I just figured I'd mention that to start. Uh, there's obviously a very long-standing uh, issue with the Scots, you know, fighting the English. So their church is not really any different from this. There were sort of long-standing issues because the way that uh, the church was structured in the lead up to 1192, England more or less ruled Scotland ecclesiastically. The uh, Scottish churches were under the auspices of York and Canterbury. But in 1192, a papal bull is issued by Celestine III, uh, I can never pronounce the name of it, so I'm just not even going to try, but it's something like uh, Commuversy or something. And this grants independence to the Scottish church away from the archbishoprics of York and Canterbury. And ironically, Scotland wouldn't get its own archbishoprics until about 200 years later in 1472, but they were granted independence, so they were no longer ruled by England. And from here, we're going to jump to Robert the Bruce and Scottish independence. Again, longstanding animus between these two. Edward Longshanks, who was a pretty, pretty powerful ruler of England, had stepped in during a succession crisis in Scotland and taken power. And there was a lot of pushback to this, but the English could not be defeated at this point. So it's kind of, you know, how things went. There's the famous story of William Wallace that's told very poorly in the story of Braveheart, although, you know, it's very entertaining. So uh, it's not a total wash, but not very good for history. Um, but Robert the Bruce, after the death of Wallace, eventually decides that he is going to fight for the independence of Scotland and the Scottish throne. And he meets with the other claimant to the Scottish throne, who is John Comyn, on holy ground in a church. And it's essentially kind of understood that Comyn was going to turn him in because he was going to fight the Scots. And Conan was like, well, if I turn him in, then I can get the Scottish throne through the English. And Robert the Bruce just kills him on the spot, which was an excommunicable offense. But what happened at the time is you had these three bishops who were very important in Scottish history. Robert Wisher, who was the Bishop of Glasgow, William Lamberton, the Bishop of St. Andrews. And St. Andrews is going to be more or less like Canterbury in terms of Scottish history. It's going to be the most important. It's going to be the seat of the church. And David D. Moravia, who was the Bishop of Moray, all these three bishops are sort of not, I mean, cabal is perhaps a too harsh way of putting it, but they're in league to try and regain Scottish independence and the independence of the church. So they rush to uh, the side of Robert the Bruce, Bruce and absolve him of the murder of John Comyn, which was sort of a very iffy thing, whether they could do that, but it was, you know, sort of understood that they could do that. 
And Robert the Bruce goes and fights his war against England, a long sort of guerrilla war. A lot of his people, a lot of his close friends over the time of this war will get captured and imprisoned and stuff. Uh, the Bishop of Glasgow, Robert, Robert Wishart, he's actually captured by the English and left to rot in English prisons. And he goes blind while he's in English prison. But he's eventually let free. And of course, the Scots win the war. So there is that sort of independence. But there's still this sort of controversy over like, can Robert the Bruce be a... Uh, can he be a king of a Christian kingdom? Because technically speaking, the excommunication would be automatic given what he did. And so there's sort of a dispute about this. But these bishops, along with several others, issue what is known as the Declaration of Arborath. And it's a petition to John II, who's Pope at the time, to rescind Robert's communication. And this, this document is very, very interesting because there's a lot here that I mean, there's a lot of just sort of flowery language that you would expect for a document like this, but there's actually a lot here that uh, gets packed into what is a pretty small document. I'm going to briefly quote from it. From these countless evils, with his help, and his here refers to Robert the Bruce, with his help, whose afterwards soothes and heals wounds, we are freed by our tireless leader, king and master, Lord Robert, who, like another Maccabees or Joshua, underwent toil and tiredness, hunger and danger with a light spirit in order to free the people and his inheritance from the hands of his enemies. And now the divine will are just laws and customs, which we will defend to the death, the right of succession and the due consent of assent of all who have all of us who have made him our leader and our king to this man, inasmuch as he saves our people and for upholding our freedom, we are bound by right as much as by his merits to choose to follow him in all that he does. And, you know, the reason that there's a lot of significance here is because you see these sort of language of covenant that is obviously very powerful in the Hebrew Old Testament, which, you know, some, some of them would have had more access to than others. But there's this idea within Scotland that, you know, we are bound together. There is a sort of popular sovereignty, but it's not a popular, it's not democracy, if you want to call it that. It's like the people support the king, the king supports the people. There's this sort of symbiotic relationship, but it's not, you know, it's not a, it's not a pure decision. Like Robert obviously had the claim on the throne. And that very briefly kind of gets us through the Scottish history in the lead up to the 15th century. All righty. Yeah, and I, uh, I identify uh, three potential points of discussion there, the sort of uh, the original papal bull and the uh, independence of the Scottish church. Um, you have the, uh, the war between the English and the Scots and the betrayal and the excommunication, and then you have the appeal to the excommunication uh, for us to discuss and draw from. Um, so... Just the first thing that I have, and you know, hilariously, despite having two very well qualified guests for the uh, Calvinist side here, this is a question about just the Roman Church. Um, if a church is independent but has no archbishop, which, if I remember correctly, is what you said, Mister Brooks, um, then how would that function? Because the way that I typically, um, to anyone on the panel that's uh, qualified to answer, the way that I typically understand this is that uh, in the sort of a ecclesiastical hierarchy. Um, you have priests, which are beholden to bishops, which are beholden to archbishops, which are, uh, if I remember correctly, beholden to cardinals. Could be wrong there. Um, and then obviously, and then above them is the Pope. Um, so if a church is independent, uh, you know, the church in Scotland, I would presume, uh, but it does not have an archbishop, then is that, uh, you know, on what grounds is it more independent than it was beforehand? Essentially, the way that it works is there was a special relationship between the Scots and Rome. My understanding is that it was actually very, uh, well, maybe not very, but it was not normative. It was not structured the way that a church would properly be structured during the era. I'm sure Panama Hat could answer uh, far better than me with yes. the normative structure of uh, the Catholic Church when it was set up. But in this particular case, there was sort of a... Uh, 
exception to the rule, if you will, a sort of uh, a special dispensation even to well, the Scottish Church. Uh, yes. So, so as um, as the influence of the Catholic Church spread through Europe, um, very often um, it, it's it's interesting because because you know in in the historiography and the history of the Scottish Church, it's often talked of as this very special relationship, and indeed that there, there was a um, uh, a, a quite unique arrangement between the Church in Scotland and the Church in Rome. Um, but the the thing is that this was actually somewhat common um depending on the region because obviously you know when you're looking at europe and and all the regions that, that were becoming Christ christian and, and, and becoming part of the fold of the church they all had their own cultures they had their own languages they had their own uh ways of worship and and things you know so that the, the the church kind of had to find a way to bring them into the fold while absorbing the culture and but without alienating um without alienating the people it, it wanted to bring into the fold, but also without admitting, you know, kind of pagan rights or anything into the, into the worship. It had to be, it had to be simultaneously uniform and, um, and regional. Uh, so basically, yeah. So um, this, so this, this whole idea of a special arrangement between, uh, between the, between the church and, and the papacy, not, not unheard of, but yes, in Scotland's case, um, I believe the Pope referred to Scotland as a special daughter of the See of Rome, is the exact quote uh, from the papal bull. The special daughter of the See of Rome. So there you go. Gives All some right. insight into the relationship. And then uh, just one last question, uh, unless there was something else that anyone wanted to add. Uh, I was just going to ask one more on the uh, organizational part of this. I, I think, um, as I recall, uh, and I'm sorry, I can't remember... The exact details here but i do remember that the scandinavian archbishops did have influence in scotland before scotland got its its own archbishops i guess because they were the closest um archbishops um so so that kind of complicated things a bit and i think when uh, james the fourth comes onto the throne there's a real push to try and make sure actually we've got our own infrastructure in scotland ecclesiastical infrastructure so that that was a, li a little bit of a complication in this um rome scotland dynamic i think all right yeah that makes that one makes sense uh because if my historical knowledge serves me correctly i believe that some of the scandinavian kings owned a lot of islands off the uh off the coast of the mainland so yes. yeah yes. not not an entire sea separated so yeah that that would make sense um and then my other question was um in order for the Scottish Church to be considered independent, uh, just the way the Catholic hierarchy works, does the Kingdom of Scotland need to be independent? That is, if it is, uh, say, subsumed by another kingdom, does the Church and its geographic boundaries of former Scotland, uh, just you know, simplifying a lot here, does that still stay independent? Or is it now beholden to the uh, ecclesiastical hierarchy of the other country that just subsumed it? Um, I guess this is more of a kind of... Uh sort of slightly theoretical sort of te technical points. I, I think my understanding is that the, again, I, I may be wrong here, but my understanding is that uh, the, because of course, we're, again, remember that we're dealing with a kind of pre, pre-national age here. You know, you don't really have nations, you have jurisdictions of kings and things. So I believe that given that the church represented um, you know the the Catholic population of of Scotland. It would that papal bull would remain in effect even if Scotland became you know um, became part of it, of another kingdom, whether it was a Scandinavian invasion of which, of which there were many, or the English or anything like that, um, or there was a, cha a change of government, a king was overthrown, etc. The 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 relationship between the Church uh, in Scotland and the Roman uh, and and Rome would would I think remain the same. Yes, this is technically correct from, from the research I've done. Now, an interesting tidbit here, uh, there is actually something I found where Pope Nicholas IV actually censored the Scottish Church because apparently there had been appointments of foreigners, particularly Englishmen, to positions in the Scottish Church. And it wasn't like, it wasn't super common. It wasn't like they were staffing the entire church with Englishmen, but it happened a few times and the Scottish church basically refused to recognize their appointment. You know, they basically said like, yeah, these are Englishmen. We're not going to listen to them. We're not going to follow them. So there's this censor in 1289 of the Scottish church 
for refusing to accept lawfully appointed uh, leaders in their church because of their uh, background, which I thought was interesting. Right. So I don't want to jump the gun here, so I might have to write this down and come back to it. But is this uh, just my sort of very simplified knowledge of this would say that that sort of, uh, uh, I don't want to call it religious nationalism because all of those words are loaded, but the sort of uh, distrust of uh, foreign ministers uh, seems to carry over from what I've been told of the Scottish Reformation, but that might be a misrepresentation of the uh, of the Scottish reformers themselves, which I'm sure we would get to if it is. Uh, but well, I think a quick clarification. Sorry, go ahead. No, I just yeah, I mean, to... I think maybe you could put it not so much as nationalism, but a sort of instinctive nativism that was definitely called upon at strategic points in the Reformation. All right. So in, in that case, that'd make it very similar to Germany. But I'm sure we could. Uh, I'm sure we can draw those connections when we get to the actual thing. The. Uh, the point that you brought up that I found especially interesting here is the sort of, uh, you know, the proto-covenant uh, that, you know, Robert the Bruce has uh, delivered independence to the Kingdom of Scotland and all of its, uh, and all the people beholden to it, and therefore they are obligated to follow him just sort of automatically. Um, th that is uh, very interesting to me just because I see in other parts of the world at around this point in time, that's not really assumed anywhere else. Uh, you can have all these different pretenders, uh, which may or may not be better or worse than the current kings or the current or the other pretenders. Uh, they'll take power, and then there's no such uh, no such cohesion between the uh, person that ends up taking power and the people beholden to that point of power. It's a it's a very interesting detail that you threw in at the end. There is there any uh, any more information on it? Well, I think uh, it's something that you're going to see pop up again and again. I think one of the things, too, that you can say about Presbyterianism, particularly as a form of Protestantism, although Protestantism more generally is, uh, this is true of it as well, is there is a lot of emphasis on the Old Testament over what was true at the time in the lead up of the Reformation. You know, the Reformers, the Calvinists particularly, uh, covenant theology is, I would say, like the linchpin of Calvinist theology. It, it, this understanding that there's a fundamental continuity of Israel, that Israel doesn't refer to the Hebrew people, but refers to God's elect within the Hebrew people. And that therefore, when Christ comes, he's not creating something fundamentally different, but the elect, there, there are now Gentiles within the elect, they're being grafted in. And this line of thinking, you know, tends towards these, I, the, these notions of covenant, these notions of reciprocal duties, right? I will be your God and you will be my people. Well, you know, that figures very neatly into, you know, I will be your king and you will be my people and the reciprocal duties that follow from that. Right. And uh, whenever we get on to the uh, more particular elements of the uh, Calvinist reforms, I am not opposed to jumping into uh, scripture because just one of my favorite points in the entire body of scripture is uh, the covenant with Abraham and uh, God taking both sides, which I've been you know, harping to AA about on Twitter for a couple of days now. But anyways, it would factor in neatly here just because I would be positively shocked if the reformers did not draw upon that moment in scripture. Uh, for most of their uh, covenant theology. Um, but uh, either way here, the idea of applying this to um, you know, secular politics, that is the politics of the world, um, you know, a, a covenant between uh, king and people, even though uh, you know, covenants hadn't really been thought of as this great thing for most of the West for a long time at this point. And then you have the Scots sort of uh, you know, articulating the idea to the Pope himself. This seems very... Uh, it, you know, if this was written into a novel, it would seem uh, foreshadowing and symbolic. <laughs> it, it's also tied in with the the Scottish practice of bonding, which, uh, although there's various equivalents in other legal systems, it, the actual form is quite distinctive to Scotland. And it's, uh, it's usually between a lord and one of his gentlemen. And the lord essentially uh, offers protection for this gentleman, usually a, a local landowner who's below this noble. And the noble then pledges himself in service. And this is a, a bond which cannot be broken, essentially. So then you get this mirrored in the, 
the covenant idea. And we'll see in the Reformation, uh, Knox and others, the lords of the congregation, explicitly draw this connection between their social practice of bonding, which is uh, everywhere in Scottish society, with the covenant. Uh, right. Um, you, uh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, we'll define these terms and these people uh, as soon as we get to the Reformation. So, uh, you know, don't worry about taking that time right now, uh, but please continue. I was going to say there's an interesting tidbit as well here uh, that ties more into our modern day. In 1997, the United States Senate passed Resolution 155, which states, quote, the Declaration of Arboroth, the Scottish Declaration of Independence, was signed on April 6, 1320, and the American Declaration of Independence was modeled on that inspirational document. When when did you say that was that was written? Sorry. Uh, the with the Declaration of Arboroth or the, uh, the Senate no, the, resolution. As, as as in the 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 thing you just said, like Senate Resolution One Fifty Five was written on the tenth of November, nineteen ninety seven. Wow. Okay. <laughs> this is this is some quite deep law. I did not. Yeah, yeah. That's this. Yeah. So, do we have the wow. text of the uh, older document? Um, the Declaration of Arboroth? Yeah. Because yes, we okay, have a full cool. text of it. All right. That, if we have time towards the end of it, um, we are going back to that because that's exactly what I would be interested in discussing. But <laughs> I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to get bogged down right here at the uh, beginning. Uh, so those three points, the uh, the independence of the Church of Scotland, uh, Robert the Bruce and his uh, you know, potential excommunication, and then the... Uh, well, uh, no, he was excommunicated. Oh, okay. The excommunication right. was automatic, but the, the declaration was a petition to rescind it, and it I, was rescinded. Okay. So, um, all right, then the excommunication and then the petition. Does anyone have anything uh, to add, any questions, uh, anything along those lines? Don't be afraid. All right, if not, uh, Mr. Brooks, I think that we are ready to continue to our next section. All right, so the next section, we're jumping back over to the continent, to the Catholic Church and sort of things that were happening at the time. And, you know, traditional uh, views of the Reformation can often start like maybe a few decades before the 1500s, or they start with Martin Luther. And this, frankly... I mean, if you're starting from this place, really, you know, the Catholics, more or less, it's hard to argue with some of their positions. The trouble is that you actually have a lot, a lot of uh, stuff that happens before the Reformation was even uh, something that was a possibility to come about back in the 1300s, the, the 14th century that happens that is quite bad. And what you had was these sort of wars over who controlled the papacy between France and Italy. And because the papacy had enormous political power, especially on the continent, there was this sort of back and forth between the Avignon papacy and the Roman papacy. And this leads eventually in 1378 to a literal papal schism. Uh, the previous pope, Gregory the Eleventh, had returned to Rome. He was an Avignon papist, uh, Avignon pope. He was in France. Uh, he'd returned to Rome in January 1377, and had planned to return to France, but he died before he could do so. And Rome was not about to let this opportunity pass. So they basically, you know, they crowd the College of Cardinals into Rome and basically tell him, "You're going to elect a Roman pope, or we are literally going to kill you." So. They elect a Roman pope, who is the uh, Urban the Sixth, and then they promptly flee to the countryside and elect a different pope, who is Clement the Seventh. And so now, within a pretty short time, you have two different popes elected by the same College of Cardinals, uh, who both theoretically have authority and now like all the nations of europe are kind of caught between well which pope do we recognize and this isn't so much scotland's thing but it's definitely england's thing england had a massive fear 
of the papacy basically just being rent boys for the French, who were their long-standing enemies. And so there was this sort of uh, implicit alliance of, well, maybe maybe we need to think a little bit more about our theology here. You know, we don't want these people telling us what we can do. And this factors into the character of John Wycliffe, who was a English reformer, educated at Oxford, and he is around in this time, in the, in the 1300s, long before the Reformation. But he is a reformer in the sense of a lot of the doctrines that are important and are sort of debated during the Reformation are actually reprises of things he was debating Rome about. And the truth of the matter is that in any normal context, John Wycliffe would have been uh, tried, convicted, and burned at the stake for heresy. And frankly, the fact that he wasn't was really only because of political factors that were particular to England at the time. His protector, John of Gaunt, was uh, an English patriot and what, you know, what uncharitably you might call a Machiavellian in the sense of he was about English power and whatever he was going to have to do to maintain English power and independence, he was going to do. And that included protecting this guy who had all these crazy ideas that everyone was like, what are you doing? And, you know, there, there had been previous like reform thought in England. William of Ockham comes to mind. But William of Ockham never challenged the Roman church the way that Wycliffe did. I mean, and the thing about Wycliffe, too, is like he is the, the sort of prototype of one of these thinkers who just kind of like thinks and thinks and thinks and gets to all these ideas that you're kind of like, eh, I'm not sure that we'd be okay with that. Like he's sort of, he's basically a socialist or a proto-socialist. His sort of opinion about Roman corruption is it swings all the way to the other side of like, uh, actually no one in the church should live at anything above like basically subsistence wages. You should all be dirt poor. And the fact that you're not dirt poor is a sign of your corruption. Now, he did hammer against real corruption that was happening. There was a lot of uh, a lot of worries about various things. And a lot of trouble that people had wasn't so much the corruption, which had been longstanding. Like, the whole idea of clerical celibacy vows, right, is something that for the most part was just sort of ignored and it didn't bother people that much. What really bothered people was the amount of wealth that the church was taking and the amount of lands that it controlled. It controlled, depending on the situation, anywhere between a third and a fifth of lands in a lot of these countries. And both the king and the people, you know, would often not be very happy with this. However, this is actually not so true of Scotland. Scotland didn't have much in the way of monasteries and monasticism uh, or classical monasticism as compared to England or as compared to most of Europe. And part of that was because of how remote it was and how few people were there. But really, the church didn't quite have the the, I guess you could say, presence there than it had in a lot of other places. And all this is important because what happens with the papal schism is that essentially every government is more or less given way more control over their national church. Well, I say national church. It's not like they're not national churches. They're all still under the auspices of Rome. But like, but now the kings more or less can appoint who they want. And you see this go to terrible effect in France, where the French, you know, literally appoint their own popes, basically. Uh, but, you know, it, it happens everywhere. The English do it, and even the Scottish do it. I mean, uh, James the Fourth will appoint his, oh, I forget what the relationship exactly to him is. Uh, oh, his illegitimate son. He appoints his illegitimate son, Alexander Stuart, as Archbishop of St. Andrews at the age of 11. Yes, uh, we, we, all, we, should, we should note at this point, um, because this may lead to some confusion, the way that the church hierarchy worked, depending on the region at this time, was normally pretty corrupt and nepotistic. So not only could anybody, regardless of their, um, regardless of their kind of qualification, if you want, uh, 
anybody could be appointed to be a priest or an archbishop or anything like that. Um, and also, uh, another issue we have at this time is that church titles and offices become hereditary. So you'll have like some some uh, and anyone who's played the Crusader Kings games will know this. You know, you could you could inherit <laughs> a, an, an archbishop or a or a deaconship or whatever. You know, you can you can actually inherit these things as a title. You can be the you can be the Duke of Argyle and also the uh, the archbishop of that area as well, or the archbishop of somewhere you know hundreds of miles away or something like that. Um, and yes, it was not uncommon for people to just be appointed to offices like this. Uh, yes, so his 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 nephew, uh, uh, no, sorry, not nephew, his illegitimate son, as was said, David Beaton, I believe. That's his name. That's that comes later. Uh, yeah. That's James the Fifth's oh, sorry, son who gets. Oh, you know, it's, it's <laughs> oh, easy to confuse, yeah, right? A lot. Yeah, it happens a lot. It's a different illegitimate. It's a different illegitimate son who got appointed. I'm getting, getting, getting my illegitimate children mixed up. Sorry. So, yeah. um, if they're uh, uh, with this section starting at the uh, papal schism and ending at sort of the uh, corruption, uh, if you have anything else to add, uh, we might get that out there and discuss this, just because I don't want to uh, lose uh, threads here. Okay, I'm going to wrap this up real quick. So skipping over all the like weird stuff in the papal schism and like the fact that both Rome and uh, France kept electing popes, and then they called the Council of Pisa in 1409 to settle this, and a third pope is appointed, but neither of the other two popes abdicate. So now you have three popes this running is, around. This is the famous the, the three, the year of the three popes, yeah. Yes. This is... This, this, this is Basically, whenever people talk about the current head of the church, the current pope, there's always somebody that says, well, Francis might be terrible in all these ways, but the church has been through worse. And what they generally mean by that is stuff it's like papal this. schism. Yeah, yeah, papal schisms, three, th three popes, uh, the papacy being controlled by various like Italian mafioso, no, uh, no noble families, things like this. Uh, yes. And this is all solved by no so this is the tie-in here that's important you have another reformer on the continent jan hus of bohemia who discovers Wycliffe's writings they're not quite contemporaries although obviously they existed roughly the same time and i believe friends of hus had listened to knox or not knox uh wickliffe uh anyway he basically says all the same things that Wycliffe was saying, sometimes even more mild, but he says them without the benefits of being in England and being under protection of a pretty ruthless prince. And because of this, he is called to the Council of Constance uh, under a uh, promise of safe conduct to explain and debate his ideas. You know, because there was some, there was a lot of feeling in the church of needing reform. I mean, the the church people, uh, the the Catholic thinkers who were pretty you know serious at the time, they they saw the corruption that was going on, and there is a sort of like there is a Protestant historiography of like ah yes, the church was just horribly corrupt, and then the nation state came to save it. And this isn't like the trouble with this is that in many cases it was these kingdoms that were doing the corruption of the church. Like, you know, in the case of Scotland, right, it's all the, the king's illegitimate children who keep getting appointed to these offices that they shouldn't have at like, you know, as children, you know, the, kind of kind very, of causing the problem and then presenting the solution a little bit. But very often there will be a split in, in such in such areas between clergy who basically say this shouldn't be happening. This is corrupt. We need to, um, you know, we need to do something about this. Generally, younger, more recently uh, appointed clergy. Then you'll have a camp of older ones that is kind of like um, that are sort of cronies of the of, of, of the state yeah. of the monarch who will say, you know, oh, this is fine. You know, they'll 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 come up with excuses for why this is perfectly valid and such. Um, but yes, the the the, the I, we should challenge the, the idea that the church was just this hopelessly corrupt, you know, like dying institution. Um, there there was a lot of pushback from within it against this kind of thing. Um, and in in fact, it's 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 ironic because many of the young highly reformist uh, priests would go on to be some of the most prominent uh, cardinals of the Counter-Reformation. Um, right. Uh, I think that's going to probably be in our uh, next segment here. If uh, I believe in yeah, one of we'll the chats, that. it was uh, Nathan Hood that said that the Catholic Church took the first initiative in Scotland to uh, 
clear corruption, but I could have been dreaming that. Uh, my... No, 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 that's correct. The, okay. the Catholic Church was the first one that started calling reform councils as such. And we'll get yeah. to that when we get to James the Fourth and James the Fifth. The final okay. thing I want to add here about Huss right. is the reason, so the Council of Constance is called, Huss is summoned uh, under safe conduct to discuss and dispute his ideas. And this doesn't happen. He's burned at the stake for heresy. He's just called in and said, do you recant your writings or not? Obviously, he says no, burned at the stake for heresy. And obviously, like, there's a lot of outrage, justifiable outrage with this. But from the council's perspective, they're trying to solve the papal schism. And they do actually do it. They do finally get to one pope instead of three. And the thing about that is because there is some dispute over the idea of conciliarism, of who has... Uh, the highest authority in the church? Is it the councils or is it the Pope? Because there is this dispute about this, the Council of Constance cannot afford any, any whiff that there is any sort of doctrinal issue with what they're doing. So, you know, I obviously, being a Protestant myself, I take strenuous issue with Huss being burned and treated the way that he is. But from the Council's perspective, there was sort of not really a choice in the matter. And they were trying to solve what was, frankly, a bigger issue in some ways, politically. And that right. more or less wraps it up. Right, yeah. I was uh, I was waiting for the uh, discussion of the betrayal of Huss. That's a, uh, that could be a stream in and of itself, uh, just with uh, you know, Huss's uh, proto-reformation. Um, but we also have another proto-reformer that we started with, uh, when we are talking about the papal schism with uh, Avignon, uh, Wycliffe and the Lollards. Um, yes. So the Lollards, if I remember correctly, and I could be wrong just because these proto-reformers sort of jumble about the same policies that you'll see with uh, denominations after the Reformation. Uh, the Lollards believed in uh, basically an absolute vow of poverty. Um, they had uh, notions of a universal priesthood, if I remember correctly. Uh, yes, and so they they right. figure in a lot here. So they uh, their main attacks, Wycliffe's main attacks in the Lollards issue, clerical celibacy and wealth, transubstantiation, yep. monasticism, and the papacy itself. Right, right, yeah. Um, and uh, there was something from the papal side that they accepted that I can't remember at this point that most Protestants didn't. Um, which is the same with the uh, Hussites in uh, Bohemia, but I can't remember specifically what it was. But uh, uh, but just to paint the picture here, it's not like the, the uh, Lollards or the Hussites were, you know, perfect Protestants, uh, you know, before 1517. Uh, you, no, you get... no, they're all proto-Protestants. Right, yeah. I mean, the you thing you about... get this uh, yeah. very interesting blend of, uh, blend of uh, doctrines that you don't see after the Reformation, but uh, yeah, please continue. Yeah, so I wanted to touch briefly a little bit uh, on another aspect of the Reformation more generally that's a lead up to it. And that is that Wycliffe translates very famously much of the Bible, not all of it, but a lot of it into English. And this starts circulating, as well as some other documents that had previously just not been um hadn't had the ability to circulate as they, and this is even before Gutenberg's printing press, but like there are English Bibles floating around and this didn't really factor so much into the people. What I'm going to do now is basically tell you the type of person who was the reason the Reformation happened. And that type of person was essentially the middle class. And this is Brooks uh, Adams' thesis in The Law of Civilization and Decay, which is an excellent book I would recommend to all of you on the more general like uh, history of Western civilization and the Protestant Reformation generally. Because what he points out is these people had actually a lot of international travels. And you'll see this in Scotland as well. The people who are bringing the Reformation to Scotland are people who had reason to encounter a lot of things outside Scotland. Scotland is comparatively fairly remote. So it's only these people who are, you know, in, in the case of Knox, right? Like he's in Geneva, he's in England, he goes to the port of Antwerp, you know, he, he goes all over. And that was pretty normal for the type of person who, you know, if you wanted to be very uncharitable, you could just call them merchants. 
But basically, like, people who got around, you sort of like middle class, and I mean, you know, commerce did actually figure into it quite a bit because they didn't traditionally have royal titles, although sometimes they bought them, or, you know, more formal titles. These are the type of people who basically, they're not, they're not the lower class, but they're also not the upper class. Right. They're sort of caught in the middle. And the reason that they... The, the reason this is important is because both the lower and upper classes were more or less generally accepting of the Catholic Church as it was. Like the corruption was kind of an issue, but from the lower classes perspective, you know, the fact that priests had, uh, you know, concubines was more or less like, ah, eh, whatever, don't, you know, don't be super obvious about it. And from the upper classes right. perspective, it was like, yeah, well, the rules don't apply to us. And the it was this middle class who look at this situation and they're the only ones who are really like throwing a fit over it because the sort of they they have reasons that this injustice offends them and they actually have the power to do stuff about it right now this is uh interesting to me and i once again i want to save the parallels to other uh other uh reformation groups until you know after we talk about the reformation itself but um, in Germany, uh, typically the historiography is uh, was entirely top down, you know, basically from the high of society uh, impressed onto the lower groups. Uh, but what you're telling me here is that the main galvanizing force is from the middle of society, uh, which is a well, very. Is... Go ahead, know, sorry. I was just going to say that's a very interesting, uh, you know, uh, not discrepancy because it doesn't need to be consistent, but a, a very interesting um, difference. Well, and Brooks Adams' thesis is specifically targeted at the English people and the Anglosphere generally. So when he's talking about this, this is much more figuring into Calvinism than Lutheranism right. per se, because Lutheranism most of the time is a situation where the prince converts and begins catechizing right. his people in Lutheranism. Right, and it's uh, that leads to a ton of mess that itself could be its own stream, but that's why you see... Uh, you know, completely different types of Lutherans even to this day. It's just because that prince, when he starts catechizing, uh, has a lot of say over doctrine, uh, whether he wants to or not, uh, which right. leads to these different beliefs. But, you know, if there's a, uh, back to what we were talking about, the middle class being angered by, like, concupiscence, um, and, uh, you know, it, not in Scotland, but land ownership in other areas. Um, just one point, I know, uh, Mr. Sandbatch, uh, a former uh, guest and hopefully a future guest as well, uh, would be very um, annoyed with me if I didn't mention his uh, one of his favorite numbers. It was something like uh, one sixth of the English population was in a holy order around this point in time, you know, something insane like that. Uh, yes, just to and show so this factor is prominently into the Reformation generally and particularly Calvinism, but not so much Scotland. From all the research that I've done, Scotland has a lot, just so much fewer monasteries. You know, there are still holy orders, like there, there's actually quite a few friars, but it's a very different, it's a difference in kind from England. And that's part of why the Reformations are a difference in kind. And even the, the popular reaction, if you want to call it that, is different. Right. Um, uh, yes, Mr. Hood? Yeah, I, I just wanted to come in, uh, not to defend clerical concubines, but but to maybe give some <laughs> explanation, because right. uh, and uh, certainly, um, so I've done a bit of study on northern Italy during this period as well, and what you find is, um, so we were talking about the corruption of appointing maybe nobles or your illegitimate son to an archbishopric, but often these these characters are not present within their diocese, and actually, um, although they're taking in revenue from them, they are... Uh, essentially hiring others to do their priestly priestly roles but what you find is these priests are often paid on a much lower salary or they're getting much less than the actual proper incumbent and so frequently they the concubines they were living with were actually also bringing in their own money into the household so it was actually um a way for many of them just to make ends meet so this this problem of concubines it because it, it's easy just to think, oh, lustful Catholic priests, right? But actually, there was a there was an economic problem, which this was in some ways 
it was causing in some ways. Right. And I was actually about to bring that up just because this oh, is, okay. uh, the, you know, concupiscence is something that usually gets misunderstood in modern day. Um, and But it actually goes a long way to explaining uh, why a lot of Protestantism looks like what it does. Um, whenever you hear about uh, Luther and I presume other of the uh, more Calvinistic reforms who I uh, reformed theologians who I haven't read as much, so I'll just stick to Luther here. Uh, when he talks about, um, you know, uh, clerical celibacy being wrong and advocating for priests to marry and all this other stuff. Um, you know, you can try to psychologize and say, well, it's obviously because he was, uh, you know, holding out for some nun that he wanted to marry who he wouldn't meet for like another decade or so, which seems a bit more far fetched than uh, the actual answer, which is usually if you grew up at this time and you were a theologian of the church, uh, concupiscence was a problem uh, and its intensity and, you know, the reaction towards it varied by person. Uh, but if you had someone who took things as seriously or autistically, if you will, as uh, Luther did, um, then it's a major issue. And, you know, how do you solve well, this? Well, Erasmus took big issue with it as right, well. Yeah. He's quoted as saying, uh, let me try and find the quote here. I just had um, it. Yes. Erasmus is quoted in the early 1500s, I believe. This is when the quote comes. Many convents of men and women differ little from public brothels. Right. Um, so it's a major issue here, and this is why you see a lot of the Protestant reformers delving into the validity of the clerical vow of celibacy, uh, you know, not because they were just secretly lustful men that wanted to, you know, marry nuns and all this other stuff or, you know, get, well, actually I won't go there, but, um, you know, it, it's not necessarily a, a uh, dream turn up. <laughs> well, I was going to say get divorces, but you know, that one might actually have validity based on who you talk to, but, um, yeah, it's not it's not for those reasons. Uh, if you look at the context, there's a lot of a uh, concupiscence uh, that was a major issue. You know, why is it an issue? Because these priests are vowing to be celibate. Uh, and then you look into, well, you know, why are we doing this? Is it valid? And a lot of the Protestant reformers come up with no. And then a lot of the uh, Catholic reformers come up with, well, yes, it is valid, but we've done it wrong up until this point, uh, which is one of the reforming parts of the Counter-Reformation is basically fixing the uh, you know, status of priests, making sure that they do get paid well enough and all the, and, you know, actually enforcing the vow of celibacy. Um, yeah, I, I figured I would touch on that being, is it something that usually gets misunderstood? Yeah, it's, it's definitely, it's definitely fairly important. Well, uh, unless anyone else has any thoughts, I think this gives us a decent springboard to go to James the fourth. All right. I, uh, think you're ready then and of course we can always come back to something if uh, anyone thinks of anything cool all right so james the fourth uh he's actually got pretty good relations with the roman catholic church despite his you know appointing of his illegitimate sons and all the rest uh and he's not as far as it goes a bad king he more or less keeps the peace in Scotland. And, you know, he does factor in somewhat to these reform efforts a little bit. The friars that I was talking about were sort of flourishing under his reign. And a friar is not quite the same thing as the, the sort of classical monastic orders. They tended to be in cities and they tended towards public preaching, which was regarded as actually a lot more useful, at least certainly in the reformers' eyes. And I would say, you know, depending on who you asked more generally, that the public proclamation was considered more useful. Um, the thing about him, too, is that he was able to get these archbishoprics. In 1472, the archbishopric of St. Andrews is established, and this is, you know, sort of the uh, to use a very rough analog, the analog to uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury. And then there's a second archbishopric uh, 20 years later that is established in Glasgow. And these factor in pretty importantly because now you actually, you know, you do have a proper archbishopric in Scotland. Now, the issue, of course, is he's appointing his illegitimate sons to it, but, you know, it's still a marked improvement in terms of the situation in the Scottish church. And 
the other thing that I forgot to mention that I want to factor in here that ties in with, you know, it wasn't just papal corruption that caused a lot of uh, the issues that foreran the Reformation. It was also the Black Death, which wiped out a huge number of people in Europe. And the thing about it that we've mentioned before a few times is Scotland is fairly remote. There aren't actually that many, you know, people as compared to the continent or even on some level as compared to England. And so tying these in, you actually really did have a shortage of priests, of people in ecclesiastical roles in Scotland. So even as much as I would like to, uh, you know, drop shade on the fact that illegitimate children are being appointed here. Like the other issue that you have is like, there aren't that many people that you really have to choose from in terms of appointments to ecclesiastical office. And in fact, one of the things that was a big issue that the Catholics and the Protestants sought to remedy in Scotland was this issue of clerical pluralism. And what this meant was even if you were appointed the priest of, you know, wherever, the salary that you got literally could not feed you. So you had this practice that was necessary that sprang up of bivocational priests, of priests that are both priests and something else, you know. And this ties in as well with the uh, Reformation and these ideas that are both on the continent and in England seeping into Scotland because a lot of the time, if you had to be a plural, uh, if you had to be a bivocational cleric, one the other vocation you were going into was going to be something trade or artisan related, which is exactly where the Protestants drew their strength from and where these ideas, where you would find them. Because you had to go wherever, or you were talking with people who traveled widely, and so these ideas were spreading you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And during this era, the English ambassador, this is another thing that I wanted to mention, the English ambassador to the Netherlands, and the Netherlands is like one of these places where all this trade is coming. And the English ambassador to the Netherlands remarks that Scottish merchants are spreading the writings of William Tyndale, who finished the New Testament working off of, uh, working off of Wycliffe in English, that his writings are being spread by Scottish merchants more than any other, I guess you could say, national group. That the Scottish merchants are really, really into Tyndale's writing, particularly his New Testament. All righty. Uh, that is, uh, I'm seeing a, a lot of my uh, you know, world history uh, you know, tropes being played out here. Trade spreads ideas. Um, you know, there's a lot of cultural diffusion. The Black Death completely rocks church relations. Uh, you have people that uh, travel that spread ideas as well. Um, you know, very fundamental forces in human civilization at play here. Um, now, something I want to know is that if a, uh, if a country, or a kingdom rather, uh, or di division has two archbishops, uh, how would that work? Do they have a specific geographical boundaries? Uh, so if I'm in like boundary one, I go to Archbishop one and can't go to Archbishop two. Uh, how, how does that work? I'm going to have to defer to Panama on this one. My understanding is, is that there's the prominence of the Archbishopric of St. Andrews and Glasgow is lesser, but I don't know if that's a, a geographical boundary per se, or it's like a, a deputy and a, you know, a leader. Well, um, it's a very difficult question to answer because it does vary depending on where you are and at what time. Oh, okay. um, and also sometimes, of course, we're, we're living in an era where geographical boundary was very difficult to ascertain. Right. Um, so very often you would have overlap. Right. And, uh, but but yes, there, there was an understood hierarchy between archbishoprics. Um, most famously, of course, in England, you have Canterbury and York. And... Uh, Although the Archbishop of York is still a very powerful position even today, he's considered, I hope I'm not wrong, correct me if I am, someone in chat, uh, he's considered um, lesser in the hierarchy than the Archbishop of Canterbury. Although, of course, the Archbishop of Canterbury, they're, they're both archbishops, so technically they're on the same level, but the Archbishop of Canterbury has the highest significance, which is why the Archbishop of Canterbury is considered the 
uh, head of the church, second only to the monarch, basically. Um, I, again, hope I've not got that wrong. Uh, Mr. Hood, did you have something to add there? I, I just have a vague relation, uh, remem- memory that the Archbishop of York takes matters on domestic policy to England now, and the Archbishop of Canterbury does the whole Anglican communion. So yeah, yes. that, is, okay. that is correct. He's superior in that relationship. Mm-hmm. All right. So so you can divide um, you know, uh, duties and uh, responsibilities between the Archbishops and, uh, and uh, one uh, kingdom. So there's a, you can have a hierarchy then. Uh, formally, even. Yes, yes, and okay. uh, I, I would say as well, for the case of Scotland, you have you have to remember the the kind of geographical layout of the country here. Where with Glasgow, it's much easier to go west, and um, because you've got the water of the Irish Sea there, travel is much easier on that coastline than going okay. across to St Andrews. So St Andrews with the east coast. Is that's kind of its jurisdiction. The West Coast is going to be Glasgow's. I so see. it's a nice little okay. division of the country in half. Right, because I'm used to thinking about Scotland as divided between the lowlands and the highlands, but it does make much more sense that you could just get on a boat and skip up the coastline uh, hmm. on, on whichever coast you're on rather than just travel between lowland and highland. <laughs> um, so yes, that, that makes much more sense. Um, and so... With the shortage of clergy, um, so we have a shortage of clergy uh, caused by the Black Death, but then we also have bivocational clergy that arises at this time. And this seems very strange to me, uh, just for the reason that one would assume that if you have a shortage of clergy, surely they would start to get paid more like other uh, vocations at this point in time. Typically, you see... um, wages rise as a result of the population decrease in the Black Death. Um, So could you, I I might have missed it or lagged out or something, why was bivocational clergy um, a thing at this point in time? It was a matter mostly of uh, of raw numbers. You know, I don't know why exactly they weren't getting paid that much if it was a more uh, Episcopal style of church government. But what I do know is just like a lot of these positions just very very remote very few people so like having a bishop there uh the reason that this also factors in is like when the reformers reorganized the scottish church they actually like the 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 reorganization involves actually they cut down on quite a few offices that they felt you know like just weren't wide enough to there weren't enough people there to merit this position's existence and so i guess you could say from a certain perspective, you know, you had too many positions for not enough money to go around because I, I mean, I don't know, but again, you're getting into matters of what could be termed opinion. You know, do you need this position or not? Well, it is, you know, it is important. These people are fairly remote. And like, if you're not going to tell them who is, but then on the other hand, like, well, you only have a certain number of resources. And so, you know, I, I don't know. I would, not really take much of a position on that beyond it's very interesting to me too and a little bit confusing as to why it happened i i'll make two conjectures here what one is scotland is just a very poor nation at the uh, when we get to 1600 this is probably the easiest comparison uh one english pound is the equivalent to 12 scots pounds so that shows you the kind of uh, difference we've got here but then I also think if we come back to the issue of uh, benefices and that many of many benefices are not being uh, so, so the income from the church properties in a parish are not going to the, the priest who's actually working in that parish. Often it's it's somebody else who has the right to that benefice who then maybe gives some of that income to the parish priest. So so that's one of the issues that um, is coming about here is these relationships are not sorted out properly. And it's it's with the uh, Counter Reformation and people like uh, Cardinal Borromeo who really tried to get to grips with that. Uh, that's when you start to see improvement in that res- respect. I see. And um, just to make sure that I didn't uh, miss here, uh, we also made the point that um, these uh, priests and bishops would learn trades also and have a mm. secular vocation outside of the church. So not just fulfilling multiple positions within the church, but so too 
uh, you know, like I would imagine like blacksmithing or something like that. Uh, was that a, was that a correct understanding? That did happen. Yes. I mean, right. I don't, I don't have data on how common that was, but it was a con it was a common enough occurrence to be remarked upon. Right. Um, now, this is interesting to me because this seems like a divide in parts of the continent. And, uh, you know, at the very least, Scotland here, I'd presume this might just have with how patterns work. This could probably be a British continental divide because um, uh, just due to how I presume much richer the continent would be, uh, would be my first assumption. Uh, typically, you don't see, um, especially in Germany, uh parts of Scandinavia and Northern Italy, I don't recall coming across, you know, any bivocational priests in the, what I read about. Uh, so it this didn't uh, happen in England either, as far as I understand. Okay, and England right. wasn't like filthy rich, but like compared to Scotland, England was filthy rich. I mean, right. especially during the era of Henry the seventh and then Henry the eighth. I have found though in, in Northern Italy, examples of priests who, during the week, are working as agricultural laborers of various kinds, and then on a Sunday, yeah, okay. are, go are going to mass. So this is a complaint of the locals. They're saying, "What makes you any different? We're working in the field with you during the yes. week, and then, uh, and, uh, and then then you're doing the mass. What gives you the the kind of right to do so?" That that anecdote is a very wise lesson for people who want to know why strict hierarchy is important, um, and it's why, for example, uh, commanders in the military don't drink and talk and sleep with their men. Um, because if they do that, then it's like, why are we taking orders from you? You're just one of us. You know, that's the whole the whole idea behind the separation. Um, but but more more specifically to get back on topic, uh, yes. And I think as was hinted out there or was mentioned, the a bit, another big part of the issue was well, how qualified are these priests? Um, you know, some of them, some of them literally could not really understand the Bible. Um, some of them could not say mass. I believe numbers of them were actually illiterate. Um, and very often, as has been mentioned, these appointments were just for the appointment's sake. They wouldn't be expected to actually take on any priestly duties. But very often this was seen as a very insulting thing to local congregations um, when you're all of a sudden somehow appointed a priest that that clearly knows nothing about Christianity, you know, and, and can't can't follow any of the, of the church uh, doctrine or stricture or really anything. Um, this was... This, this was a problem, I believe, in uh, areas of rural Scotland in particular, and would go on to have quite a big effect on the Reformation, um, which ties into, I don't want to jump too far ahead, but ties into the whole, uh, the Renaissance that was happening in Scotland, um, where Scotland kind of, uh, from this period, from the 1400s up to the 1800s, was seen as a, a great centre of intellectual, in, intellectual in, in, enlightenment, um, and invited kind of all these French and Italian, German scholars, to come and teach they had they had more universities in, than england did um you know and all this kind of thing so they get that this played a part this this whole idea that you need education and and you can't just have all these priests that can barely understand the scripture you know yeah right. I, I think um so i remember reading somewhere the the only qualification that you needed to be a priest was that you could say the mass not understand it as long as you could say it then you were you you were qualified during this period um which brings that very much into sharp focus. Well, I think from here, maybe we we'll, we should jump to uh, Patrick Hamilton, the first and most notable. Well, I won't say that, actually. He's definitely not the most notable. That would be uh, nice, but the first <laughs> real reformer. Before we do, the whole reason I was bringing up that bivocational part is because if I look in the modern day and I uh, look at how many um, just around me, uh, and it seems doctrinal, though, as we've hinted at, I'm sure there's also material concerns. Um, you know, it seems to vary by denomination which priests will take a second job, priests or pastors uh, will take a second job, and which ones will just be entirely devoted to their call. Um, you know, I see uh, Anglicans, uh, Lutherans, Catholics, uh, and some Presbyterians around here seem to be just full-time, though I don't know if that's entirely uh, uniform, just given the... Uh, uh, how I've seen Presbyterianism presented in other parts of the country. And then obviously you get Baptists and other sort of uh, other uh, second great awakening denominations where they will, you know, work other jobs during the week. Um, yeah. This, uh, this comment is a, on this briefly as well. When right. Yeah. I was just bringing this up because it's a, a thing that I still see in the modern day. 
uh, you know, the bivocational thing. It, it, now it's just split by denomination rather than uh, geographical uh, location, it seems. Well, it's somewhat based, too, on, like, which denomination we're talking about, right? So, like, my my pastor has talked about that bivocationalism is probably only going to spread in America due to uh, the church waning here. But, you know, it depends a great deal even on which Presbyterian I'm talking about. Because if you're talking like the Presbyterian Church of the USA or the Presbyterian Church in America, and the reason there are two that sound very similar is because one is the uh, the mainline sort of libtard denomination, and the other one is the one that broke off from them. Uh, you know, both of those, you know, they're going to be paying their people enough to live. You know, it won't be, you know, you're not going to get rich, but, you know, you'll be fine. Uh, the Anglicans, it depends a great deal. I know quite a few cases of Anglicans or Episcopalians of the much smaller denominations there, the the faithful remainers who have to be bivocational. Obviously, if you're working for... Uh, you know, a lot of the mainline churches, that's not going to be a problem, but then like not too many people in the mainline churches. So, you know, it's sort of always a trade-off. Uh, the Lutherans, uh, I, I don't know. See, the thing that I wonder about is, I don't know, Ryan, if you ever listened to this, but there was a podcast I listened to ages ago where they talked about that this was a thing that was really true of Lutheranism kind of out in the sticks. And I think they were talking in the Canadian context, not the American one, but that this was something that was, that was already true and was only, you know, kind of going more in that direction. And then I know, yeah, the Restorationists, there are a lot of them that do this, like the, the Adventists, the Baptists. Uh, etc. It's it's not it's not normative, but it is definitely not as uncommon as it was at one point. Right, and, and that's why I bring it up is just because that's a uh, modern tie-in that you can still see, though you know, probably definitely not for the same reasons as we're seeing here, where you know Scotland is literally just so poor that you have to uh, you have to be bivocational as a priest. Um, you know, I, I have heard doctrinal argument arguments in the uh, modern day for or against it. So um, with that being said, though, I think that we're ready to continue on now that we've talked about the sort of proto-reformation spreading throughout uh, throughout the, either the continent and uh, both the continent and Britain. So, uh, Mr. Brooks, if you will uh, take us away. Yes. So now we get to the reign of, uh, we sort of already touched on the reign of James IV, and his reign is just about over as this character emerges for us, Patrick Hamilton. Patrick Hamilton was the son of nobility of sorts. He was highly educated. He went to the University of St. Andrews. He really took in a lot of the sort of humanism that, as other people have mentioned, was really actually very common and popular in Scotland, particularly at the, the higher levels. And he gets an order against him while he's more or less is still learning and still in this milieu in Scotland of like, well, he sounds like he has some reform sentiment. Maybe we should check this out. And he flees to the continent to learn under, oh, I forget which one, but he learns under the Lutherans. He's not, uh, he's not, in Geneva dealing with Calvin, he's learning from, I believe, the jurisdiction of Philip of Hesse, or however it's pronounced. Okay, right, yeah. Uh, which would be one of the first uh, first German nobles to convert to Lutheranism. Yes. So, so he's learning uh, Lutheran doctrine, and he is persuaded to come back to Scotland. And when he does, he decides he feels called to preach just freely preach in St. Andrews, which is the, as said, sort of the ecclesiastical seat of the Scottish church. Uh, he's more or less, you know, kind of, I mean, he's doing it politely, but, you know, he's saying the sort of things that it was kind of understood that if you say them, it's not going to end well for you. Uh, but for, I guess, the reasons of the humanist ideas that have penetrated Scotland at this time, he's more or less permitted to do so. He he disputes with a lot of 
uh, Roman Catholics in St. Andrews. Like they would set up these debates where he would go back and forth with them. Uh, but eventually with the death of James IV and the ascent of James V, who appoints his illegitimate son, David Beaton, to be Archbishop of St. Andrews. Uh, David Beaton invites uh, Hamilton basically to what is sort of understood as like, well, it's sort of a trial and it's sort of a dispute. And there's some, you know, there's some debate about how much Hamilton knew, but what some sources seem to say is that at the very least, he was guaranteed that regardless of how this trial would go, he should surrender his arms because even if they convicted him, they would deliver him back to his friends before anything happened. So from his perspective, here's a chance to sort of like go before certain people and, you know, make his points. And so as he's questioned by David Beaton and these other guys, he's fairly, you know, he's open with his beliefs. He's just, you know, honest. And they decide that actually this is dangerous enough. We really can't let him go. Right. And before we, we also get to that, uh, before we get to that climax point, what were the beliefs that were so, you know, scandalous or rocking? So it's a lot of Lutheran stuff. So he's introducing the law gospel distinction. He is attacking pretty vehemently clerical celibacy. Uh, the he's not quite as harsh as many others on like the idea of the pope but he's also very very strong on the importance of scripture and his perceive uh his belief that is frankly lacking in the education of both priests and of the church more generally that they don't have a high enough focus on scripture so it's it's fairly sort of i guess you could say boilerplate ideas of the early reformation uh, scola, uh, sola scriptura to a certain, I mean, I don't know that he would have said the words sola scriptura, but like the importance and primacy of scripture, uh, the problems with clerical celibacy, the problems of the Roman, uh, the Roman Pope as an office, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's not, he's not particularly, you know, if you took him in the, I guess you could say, if you compared him against other reformers, he's fairly benign. But the difference is he's just very, very honest about it. And he's very honest about it without, frankly, you know, thinking too much about the politics of it, which in some ways is really his downfall. All right. Because, yeah. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say that's good. Uh, don't let my don't let that interjection there uh, throw you off. Yeah. So Beaton and the others basically are like, well, we can't really let him go back out there because of the doctrines he's espousing. And we can't really hold him because his friends will come after us and they're fairly well armed. So uh, we'll just kill him. So they, they, they try him, convict him, and burn him at the stake all in the same day. And there's a particular irony to this that I wanted to bring up that just you know sticks in my craw a little bit even. One of the things that Hamilton was very forceful on is his belief that clerical celibacy was wrong and deeply unfair to clerics. And the irony of this case is that David Beaton, the man who burns him at the stake, is a father of eight with his longtime mistress, uh, Marion Oglivy, I believe her name is pronounced. But basically, I mean, it's just, I don't know. There's a particular irony to the fact that like, one of his chief complaints is clerical celibacy. And the guy that kills him has like eight kids. But that's neither here nor there. Uh, his death is one that kind of makes the reformers in Scotland start thinking, we have to be very, very careful. And so they, they really start to try and keep their nose clean as much as possible. And this leads us now into the reign of James V. James V, more than James IV, really appoints his cronies to church offices, which, in fairness to him, he's inheriting a time that is pretty fractious and where politics is of very heightened importance as the Reformation is going on on the continent and as England is going through it as well. So from his perspective, it was a sort of case of like, well, 
you know, I need people I can trust politically and like, okay, like these priests or whatever, who my universities are turning out, like how much do I really trust them? I need people I can trust. You know, you can almost, I don't know, compare. He's not, he's very different in many ways from Henry VIII, but there are some similarities. He also understood like the issue of both Scotland and his kingdom personally being very poor. So he raised royal revenue by uh, 72,000 pounds in four years. And he did that mostly by taxing the church. And he didn't tax, like he didn't accompany this with much in the way of like, there was some effort to reform. There were councils that were called, but there wasn't that much in the way of progress. It was essentially a situation where they came together and were like, yeah, this is a serious problem. We should deal with this. And the royal authority was sort of like, great. I'm glad you think that. Now give us more money. You know, it was, it was a pretty bad situation. You know, the church of Scotland was already not very wealthy and was kind of stretched thin. And he more or less like took everything that wasn't nailed down in some ways. And part of this too, is that even though the Protestants are being very careful and are very worried about David Beaton, uh, there isn't really, I mean, and Beaton gets pushed out of the scene fairly early, but even as these next two decades progress, there is really very little persecution in Scotland compared to England or the continent. Like you'll have, you know, sporadic cases of one or two people getting burned at the stake, but James is very unwilling to bloodlet in his kingdom and thus kind of keeps the church on a very short leash in terms of who he allows it to go after. All right. And um, with that, I think we've reached the end of this small section. So uh, you mentioned that Patrick Hamilton had sort of like pseudo nobility ties or something like that. Uh, is there any uh, elaboration there? Is that all a uh, conjecture? Because that's uh, that's interesting to me. He was the second son of Sir Patrick Hamilton of Kincavel and Catherine Stewart, the daughter of Alexander, Duke of Albany, second son of James II of Scotland. Oh, cool. Oh, okay. So he's not as far away as he might seem from a, from sort of like the royal sphere of Scotland. Yeah, no, I mean, it would be a few degrees of separation. Obviously, he's still, you know, he would not be in line for offices in the same right, way. Right. But he definitely wasn't like a commoner. So... What was the royal reaction to him uh, being you know, either martyred or executed, depending on who you ask? Well, you know, Beaton was uh, Beaton was James V's guy. So there was a right. sort of like, you know, he it was a political judgment from his perspective. And, you know, it, it was sort of like, oh, well, this is kind of what happens. Now, the thing about this is very shortly thereafter uh david beaton is or no 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 this is actually further on but david beaton will wind up being assassinated oh, okay. uh, in a retaliatory strike against someone else i believe yeah no All a right. different reformer that beaton goes after causes him to be uh murdered well, that's i i find that very interesting because uh most other reformation figures that we see um, save for a lot of the Anglicans, uh, you know, the Lutherans, a lot of the Calvinists that I come across, uh, you know, the vast majority of their major figures are not royal. Uh, you know, Martin Luther was a monk and a lawyer, or I know, not a lawyer, uh, metaphysician. Calvin's the lawyer. Yeah, Calvin's the lawyer. Um, yeah, monk, uh, Luther, the monk and the metaphysician, sorry. And, um, then you see, uh, let me see, Zwingli. I do not remember the background, but I know it was not royalty just because of his geographic position. Zwingli was a politician. He yeah, was a pretty good it. one, too. So, um, you know, when you're telling me that uh, one of the first uh, sort of figures in uh, Scottish Protestantism was, you know, basically a nobleman, you know, slightly removed from you know, the main line of the Scottish uh, kingdom, uh, that's a... Uh, that's a big difference from most of the other Reformation figures. So, yes. Um, 
will this come into play later? Uh, just because you know, the, I I see this difference here. Uh, does does this have any impact? The fact that uh, Hamilton uh, was of you know higher birth than the yes. other. Okay. The the impact here is that where this maybe isn't so much true, and I mean I have to study it because other than England, I'm not. You know, the Reformation, I know like the broad strokes, but some of the details I would have to study more. But in Scotland, particularly, the reaction of the nobility is any of the ones that have Protestant sympathy basically decide like, OK, so uh, if we're going to not wind up the way that he did, we're going to have to play politics. Right. Okay. And play politics very shrewdly. So there is actually a lot more royal involvement on the, I guess you could say on the ground level in Scotland than there is like, say in England. And okay. I mean, I would have to check, but probably then existed on the continent as well. So, um, and did this also factor into why he was so open about his beliefs? Did he have like any uh, impression that this sort of higher status would protect him? Yeah. Okay. And especially because of how he was invited back and he's, you know, his understanding of James V, which was mostly correct, and of Beaton, which was, you know, less, uh, less certainly correct, <laughs> was these guys like me, you know, they understand how the game is played. It's a political thing. Like, yeah, we disagree on religion, but we're all humanists here. We're allowed to debate. So as long as I don't like, as long as I am not a personal jerk to these people, they're going to let me say what I'm going to say. All right. And that, of course, was not how things went. And, and the last thing that I wanted to bring up, and then, you know, obviously we have two other panelists here to ask and discuss, um, raising royal revenue by taxing the church. I recall this causing wars in other parts of the uh, Catholic world. Um, was, the church's show, uh, was the church just so... Um, unimportant or uh, non-hegemonic in day-to-day -day life that he could just do this? They were already so under the thumb of royal authority. Okay. That would be my answer. All right. So uh, that was that, those were the things I wanted clarification on. Uh, Mr. Hat, Mr. Hood, uh, by all means, if you guys have anything to add or question or anything like that. I, I just had a, a quick question because um, Hamilton comes back, was it 1527? Was that correct? 27 is when he returns to Scotland, yes. Yeah, so you've got in 1529, the English Reformation Parliament is called by Henry VIII. So I'm just wondering if if you could see a possible connection of... You were mentioning, uh, Ryan, about how uh, often it's not royalty that's pushing Reformation. Yet down in England, we've got a royal, a monarch pushing Reformation, or at least right, a split right. with Rome. So I, I, do you think there's a reasonable connection you could draw there? Uh, the Scots looking down and saying, okay, we could maybe emulate that, or at least some of them. Well, Hamilton is murdered or executed, however you want to uh, square that, in 1528. And James V, while he's unwilling to persecute Protestants the way that many others are, is also very unwilling to pursue those sort of structural changes. The other thing you have to keep in mind is that the Reformation in England, until the time of Edward's reign, so until the time that you have Cranmer given more or less free reign to reform the church doctrinally, you're dealing in large part with what is a political revolt against the perceived continental uh, Babylonian slavery of the church, if you want to you know, put it that way. Um, that being that the English crown and English patriots want the English church to be independent and not under the authority of someone outside of them so that it can be used against them. And in Scotland, this is just not, it doesn't factor in in the same way because the royalty already had such incredible authority and power over the church that the idea of the church being like a sort of turned into a fifth column against the royal interest was just so absurd that it wasn't really something people ever considered. Like the idea of, uh, of nationalizing the church the way that uh, the way that it happened in England under Henry VIII was not something that was going to be any sort of serious consideration people thought about during the reign of James V. All righty. And uh, Mr. Hatt, do you have anything that you wanted to add or uh, discuss? 
Um, no, not specifically. Um, <clears throat> I agree with the point that was made that uh, in many places, you know, the church hierarchy was completely dominated by the uh, the monarchy or the aristocracy, depending on what, what you have. Um, no, nope, that's basically all, all fine with me. All right. Um, yeah, I, I still just find this absolutely wild that the, uh, you know, the Scottish king can just levy a giant tax on the church and then everyone just accepts it because that's just the way it is. That's a... Uh... I, I can see why the Scottish Reformation went so differently. Like, you're, you're laying this all out quite nicely, uh, especially with my knowledge on the more continental side of things. So, by all means, please keep going. All right, so now we have the death of James V in 1542. And, you know, by this point, the Reformation Parliament has been called in England. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of political aspects to this. And you have what had been previously this long-standing fear in Scotland of domination by the English dating back, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years, you know, arguably even longer than that. But because James V dies, the only person he has in line for the throne is Mary, Queen of Scots. And Mary, Queen of Scots at this time is an infant. She, she has no, like, you know, obviously she's not going to be making any decisions. So what this effectively means is that her French mother, Mary of Guise, is... I, I'm probably butchering that pronunciation so bad. I apologize to any is French it, people listening. Is it Guise? Uh, Guise, maybe. Okay. Yeah. Geese. Um, Mary of Geese. 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 <laughs> I'm going to okay. change it to the spelling of like the, the bird, the geese, Mary so, of Geese. Uh, uh, yeah, just, just one little, just because this is my stream, I can afford to be just slightly lax. I hate to tell you, Mr. Hood, but every single person in like real life that I have heard pronounce that pronounces it Geese. So, oh, no. uh, <laughs> just, just, just wait well, till Wycliffe versus Wycliffe later down the line. Oh my gosh, <laughs> don't even get me started on that. I've, so, I've switched pronunciations on that during the same conversation. <laughs> so, so anyway, anyways, uh, Mary Queen of Scots and the uh, and the uh, Geese. yeah, her regent Mary of Geese, uh, who is a French noblewoman, her mother, Mary of Geese, and David Beaton effectively now rule, they take the throne. And there is another figure who is also sort of ruling as well. And this is James Hamilton, Earl of Iran, who is a Protestant and has tremendous influence. But he is perceived as uh, an Anglophile. And this is partially because, you know, the current party in power, David Beaton and Mary of Geese, are... Francophiles. They're very, I mean, obviously, Mary Geese is French herself, but they're very, very tied in with the French. A lot of connections there, a lot of deep connections. So they're sort of now in Scotland, this new monarch who's obviously not making any decisions herself, but the regents of this monarch have now thrown Scotland into this sort of detente between English domination and French domination. And of course, from the English perspective, obviously, the idea of a French client state on their northern border scares the ever-living crap out of them. So now England is deeply interested in what is happening in Scotland, particularly with the Reformation. And there is more covert support of Protestantism in Scotland from England. Right, and forgive me for the uh, <clears throat> second interjection when I promise you I wouldn't do that before the start of this. Um, uh, I believe this is something the Panama Hat and I discussed on our gunpowder plot stream, <clears throat> was the English interest in uh, Scottish developments just because of fears of French overtaking. Uh, so yeah, uh, this uh, we have mentioned this on this channel before, but of course, uh, only check that out after we are done here. Uh, Mr. Books, please continue. Uh, yes, yeah, so... There's sort of this, you know, as I said, this detente, because even though there's an understanding that there's a French party, there's an English party, the humanism is still kind of holding. The Scottish Parliament in 1543 legalizes the reading of the Bible in the common vernacular, which had previously, I mean, you know, one can debate how enforced that was, but it had previously been illegal. So they legalized that in 1543. You can read your Bibles in the common language. And there's this sort of tentative piece. And this piece is broken by things that come up with another reformer 
named George Wishart, who I believe is actually a descendant of the same Wishart who rots in English prison and who personally uh, heard the confession of Robert the Bruce. Uh, he as well is a highly educated guy, University of Aberdeen, uh, studied on the continent. His mother was the sister of Sir James Learmouth. So he has some sort of semi-aristocratic connections, but far less than Hamilton. Um, he's highly educated. He's very connected to the English. He's sort of, he is now perceived as like the chief reformer in Scotland at this time. And he's doing sort of somewhat similar things to Hamilton is doing, although a little bit more carefully. You know, he is preaching where he can. He's spreading the ideas of Calvin and Zwingli. Uh, he translated into English the Helvetic Confession of Faith, which was completed in 1536. And that's the more Calvinistic understanding that comes out of uh, Geneva. Um, he are, he, I mean, he is functionally a Calvinist. He is, the ideas of Calvin are present in his ideas that he is introducing to Scotland. And he runs into sort of the same deal as Hamilton, where he sort of gets strung along by promises and whispers in the ear, and then he's executed. But the trouble is that the Reformation now is much, much deeper in Scotland and is has seeped into a lot of the nobility. And there's this nobility that has this informal agreement that and they'll become to know they'll come to be known by this title, but it didn't exist at the time. They were called the Lords of Congregation. And what it essentially meant was they were Protestants who were sort of like, you know, they were playing the game. They, they weren't like rocking the boat as far as Rome was concerned, but they were in, in, a, in, a, in a fundamental agreement with each other that we are going to Protestantize Scotland. We are just waiting for the right time. And some of the friends of the Lords of Congregation in the wake of Wishart's execution, uh, they're all Lords from, the, uh, from an area called Fife. They assassinate Beaton in reprisal and take St. Andrew's Castle, which was obviously his archbishopric. And this is where now the peace is broken. Uh, you know, Beaton, who is really a very important figure to continuing the Roman rule of the area, has been killed. And Mary of Geese now decides that if she is going to continue being regent, she cannot tolerate this. But you know, raising an army during this time is a lot more complicated than we would think it would be, and even than it was, you know, maybe a hundred years later. So what she does is she enlists French aid. So now there are literal French troops on Scottish soil sieging the castle of St. Andrews for over a year. And during this siege, one of the members of this sort of plot... And the chaplain of these forces during the siege is a man named John Knox. And John Knox is more than probably, arguably more than any figure other than maybe Luther in Germany, like an avatar of the Reformation in his country. And, you know, I'm sure that Nathan probably even knows more about him than I do, but he's a very, very interesting figure. But we'll get to him in a minute here. He, along with the rest of the Scottish forces that had assassinated Beaton, they fall. St. Andrews falls to the French forces, and all the captured parties are sold as galley slaves, which, if any of you know anything about that, is a pretty miserable existence, and will be sort of taken out of Scotland, and tentative peace is restored for the next two years or so. Well, for the next, like, really decade or so after this, after this castle falls. All right. So uh, with that little section coming to an end here, uh, I just need something to be cleared up because I don't know uh, the timeline for this, nor do I know the actual demographics. Um, usually when I think of, uh, you know, post-Reformation Scotland, which we aren't in post-Reformation, we're during it already, but... Um, 
it's usually my understanding that it's split between um, Catholics, Calvinists, and Anglicans, which, you know, Anglicans have Calvinist influence, but they aren't the same group. Uh, is that a fair characterization? And if so, how is it split? And when does, you know, like the Anglicans arrive? And, you know, when do we see surges? Just so that we can get like a basic timeline to work off of here. Well, I think to, to answer your question, I'm going to need to give you a little bit of preface in terms of like Calvinistic theology and the way the distinction between Presbyterianism and Anglicanism, both Presbyterianism and Anglicanism are fundamentally Calvinist. Once Thomas Cranmer right, is right. given the freedom to write his confession, like Anglicanism is, I mean, I won't say exactly that as Cal, but like they are both very Calvinistic groups. And so the idea of Episcopal church government, which would be Anglicanism versus Presbyterian church government, uh, both of these parties are fundamentally Calvinist. And this split really doesn't exist until they're allowed to settle what church government is going to look like. Like it's right, functionally okay. just two parties of the Calvinists versus the uh, the Catholics. Okay, right. And and the reason that I uh, split the two groups, at least mentally, uh, is because typically when I read Anglicanism at this time, it tries to market itself as a middle way between Lutheranism and Calvinism. Uh, but, you know, I don't know. I don't even know when that came to be. Uh, so that could be anachronizing trying to read this back into Scottish uh, uh, Reformation development. So it is just the two parties then, you know, Calvinist, Reformed, uh, Protestants versus Catholics. Uh, that's the correct way to view it. Yeah, I mean, I could get into the weeds a little bit more, but for uh, the case of Scotland particularly, it doesn't matter so much. So I think we best leave it to uh, okay. another stream, perhaps. All right. Um, I would I would just like to broach, a, to kind of ask a question to clear up my own understanding here. So reading about the history of the the Scotch uh, Re Reformation always sort of... Um, it's, it's not so much like the Reformation in England where they just immediately sort of split from the church in one go. And for a lot of it, it seems that the actual relationship between Rome and the church is, or the Kirk as it would become is, is quite unclear. Like, like, the, like uh, at what point do you have the actual severing as such of the, of the Kirk from, from Rome? Oh, that's not going to be till the Reformation Parliament, which is in 1560, and there's a war before that happens. So if you said to an average Scots churchgoer, you know, what are you? They would have answered Catholic at this, at this specific time. Well, okay, see this. All right, maybe we do have to get into the weeds a little bit. When the Calvinists were, uh, during this era, during the 16th century, the Calvinists did not call themselves Calvinists, nor did they call themselves Presbyterians or Anglicans. They would have called themselves Reformed Catholics, and they would have opposed this to Romanism, not Roman Catholicism. And this dates back to both uh, Knox and Wishart, and Calvin, all of them believed, and this is sort of a Calvinistic belief more generally, that they were the ones in fundamental continuity with church history, and that the Roman church was the one by their innovations that had broken continuity with church history. So the idea of a Catholic, they would have all called themselves Catholics, including the most Calvinists among them. And the other thing that happened at the time was that you had this sort of... Uh, you had this situation where pretty much everyone was going to the Catholic masses, but you basically had like churches within churches, basically. And the Lords of Congregation figure into this somewhat uh, prominently, but it, you know, it was, it wasn't just them doing it of like, you would have basically everyone would go to church on Sunday, go to the mass. And then there would be like these more uh, smaller and secret enclaves of like, and then the Protestants get together to do their own thing and sort of discuss it. And this dates back to, as well, the sort of belief that, you know, in many cases, the difference between a Calvinist, and, like, it, it, the difference between a Calvinist during this era and a Roman Catholic is considerably less than the difference between a Calvinist in this era and, say, a modern-day Seven Adventist or Baptist. They're not as far as perhaps we can sometimes think because of the hindsight of how things happened 
and particularly in terms of like worship, the Roman mass, particularly as it was practiced in Scotland, frankly, because they were just dirt poor, but it was not nearly as offensive to them as it was on the continent or as it was in England. I hope that answers your question sufficiently. Answer some of mine too, if it doesn't his. So uh, yes, it does. Thank you. <laughs> so, but yeah, I like this. Um, you see this in Lutheranism as well, the sort of uh, middle ground while it's happening, or not middle ground, but the sort of uh, vague gray area um, where you don't necessarily have people, you know, saying, I am, you know, this sect or this denomination or the one true church or something like that just yet. Um, what you have are people basically forming into two sides, but, you know, still perceiving themselves in the same congregation or church, uh, which... Uh, you know, if anyone's interested in alternate history or, uh, you know, what could have been counterfactuals and all this other stuff, perhaps this might be a good place to start for the Reformation is uh, just this sort of uh, gray area that's, as it exists right here. But anyways, that's all that I have to add there. All right. Well, unless uh, either of you guys have anything uh, to question or ask as well, I think I'll go into the story of John Knox and then the Lords of Congregation. I think you're ready. All right, then. So we kind of already touched on Knox. He's uh, the son of merchants. You know, again, all these guys had sort of like several degrees of separation. Like none of them were pure commoners. But that was mostly just because like you had to have that level of connection to get educated at all. And they really would not have been considered royalty or aristocracy in Scotland during this era, you know, second sons, once removed, twice removed, etc. cetera. Uh, but he was, John Knox, highly educated and studied widely. He studied under uh, several people on the continent before he came back to Scotland and fought during the reprisal against Beaton and then the capture and siege of St. Andrews. He was with Wishart, uh, when Wishart was taken into captivity and Wishart basically told him like, don't worry, I don't need you. You know, you have other things to worry about. Don't follow me. And so this is one of the things that kind of plagues Knox a little bit is the fact that like his mentor, cause he was probably closer to Wishart than anyone else. You know, he had basically just like amicably said goodbye and he never saw him again alive. And this also factors into why he was a part of the reprisal against Beaton. But as we mentioned, you know, eventually St. Andrew's Castle falls to the French and he is sold as a galley slave, which I'm not going to dwell too much on the detail of it. But basically, you know, you're stuck in the hold of a ship rowing 24 hours a day. I mean, not quite 24 hours a day, but, you know, you're rowing uh, constantly. I, I, I believe that on this particular journey, Knox and the other captives were made to row for roughly three days. Yeah, um, pretty much without any sort of break. Um, yep. and it's it's remarkable because John Knox is one of these characters in history who just lived an absolute life. I mean, <laughs> every really chapter did. in his life is something remarkable. You know, I was I was I remember when I first read a, a book about him um, some some years ago now. Just getting to this point where it's like, and then he became a, <laughs> a galley slave, and had to, it's like it it is. It, bear in mind at this point, he's already done quite a significant amount of things, you know, and now he's a galley slave. It's it's like something out of, you know, it's something out of the Old Testament or the sort of Roman antiquity, you know, somebody being consigned to the galleys. Um, but yes, it was a, a French expedition under an Italian noble commander. Um, that captured him. <laughs> this sounds like a this sounds like a fairy tale, and I'm not saying that to disparage the story. It's just the sort of how, uh, you know, fantastic, fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of is. unbelievable. Yeah, and I haven't even gotten to uh, his return yet, and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, oh, no, there's, and, a lot, there's a lot more coming. Yeah, but before we get there, just because I like, I don't know if I made this clear at the outset. I have absolutely no uh, clue about the Scottish Reformation. That's why I'm not really talking about why I've gotten such a panel together to uh, educate me. Uh, <laughs> when you were talking earlier about you know the you know the defenders being sold into galley slavery. Um, I just kind of Im implicitly assumed, oh, well, Knox must have been exempted or something due to clergy status. No, no, he, this is... No, he was happening. sold alongside yeah. him. 
And there's cool. there's some funny stories from this. There are two anecdotes that I'm going to share from when he was a galley slave. And the first of these, and, you know, obviously, like, there's some dispute as to veracity, although, you know, with sources, I, I tend to believe that both of these are correct, uh, particularly the second one. Uh, the first one was the prisoners were forced to, they were, they were trying to get the prisoners to venerate images of Mary. Like, they would shove them in their faces to try and get them to quit, kiss them. And Knox allegedly took one of these images in his hands and then threw it overboard and said, you know, let Mary learn to swim since she is so light. Yeah, it's a sort of uh, famous quote uh, of the period. Um, yeah. yeah. And, you know, the apparent, like, the story, so the story goes, after John Knox does this, the French stop trying to get their galley slaves to venerate images. And... You know, Knox several times is really at death's door, but every time he comes back, I, honestly, miraculously in some ways. I mean, it ties into like this belief in the Old Testament, right? Like you read the story of John Knox and John Knox would have been familiar with the Old Testament. And he really does sound, you know, he sounds like an Old Testament figure, like the amount of times that he just like, just keeps coming back. And there's this famous story too of when, this expedition is off the shores of Scotland near Dundee, where John, where, uh, John Knox had preached previously. His fellow prisoner, James Balfour, asked Knox if he recognized the church spire. And John Knox looks at him and says, I will not die until I have preached there again. I mean, this is, this is awesome. I, I'm, I'm enjoying this. Keep it, keep it up. The, uh, I don't want to say prophesying because I, as Christians, that's that carries with it a certain uh, authority, but sort of like the, uh, you know, the promises that are being made here in the journey. A declaration, so, yeah. Yeah, declaration. This could fit into like a sort of Scottish uh, Iliad or Odyssey, just the amount oh, of... Oh, uh, without doubt. Like, I, I'm, I'm almost in fact surprised that it hasn't been done, but please keep going. So in 1549, and then there's some dispute over who did it, but Knox and the galley slaves are freed. And it's most probable that they were freed by the English because they returned to England. And obviously the English are familiar with John Knox and they would have every reason to think, you know, if we can deliver this guy out of slavery and, uh, you know, send him on his merry way, this will be politically for us excellent. And theologically for us, also not bad either. Right. Uh, not that I would uh, compare Knox the person to such a vile figure, but is this the equivalent of the Germans uh, sending Lenin to Russia? Uh, well, so I mean, there's a long-standing history of those rather uh, unfortunate comparisons. Not oh, okay. between uh, Knox, but like the, it's very interesting if you, re I mean, okay. I'm going to regret <laughs> saying the sentence out loud. It's very interesting when you read sort of certain communist literature the obsession they have with the Calvinist movement specifically, both as something that they deeply dislike, but also as something that they deeply respect in a very strange way. And, you know, that, that would be that if you, you could probably find a doctrinaire Marxist who would make that comparison, Ryan. I'm just okay. going to tell you All right. that. All right. Uh, I just just trying to make sure I'm not misunderstanding it. Like I'm not saying that you know Knox is Lenin. Please, for the love of God, don't yeah uh, no no I get on that. Um, it just it, it you know sending a uh, an intellectual figure to a country to uh, uh, you know bring about uh, politically advantageous conditions. Uh, I have you know I have only one other uh, time in history that really pops into mind of this happening. You know if I could think about it more, I could probably come up with more. But that uh. World War One example, obvious example, uh, right? Yeah. So um, some scholars have definitely made that comparison, uh, saying that John Knox was the first true liberation theologian. Wow, that's yeah, painful. which is a yeah, <laughs> it's a, that introduces a whole another can of worms that uh, I don't think I want to get into here. But uh, right, anyway. So we Knox, can continue the great uh, odyssey of John Knox on the galley. Yeah, let's go on. Yes. So he returns to England, he marries an English woman there, and he preaches there. He's given appointment in the English church and, you know, really develops 
what I mean, he had already been a great preacher, but he's developing this more and more and more. And then, of course, Mary Tudor ascends the throne. And at this point, you know, having learned the lessons of his forebears, he's like, I'm not going to risk that. So he returns to the continent uh, to go to Geneva to study under Calvin. And Calvin is a, a very, very close to him. And he's a good friend. And he returns to Scotland briefly in 1556, despite severe misgivings. But Mary of Geese promises not to arrest him. And then shortly thereafter, he's called back to Geneva. Calvin gives him this great post and he happily resides there until 1559. And we will have to leave his story there and get back to it because now we have to explain what's going to bring him back to Scotland in 1559. And that is the Lords of Congregation. So after the uh, reprisal against David Beaton and his assassination, uh, there had been a more serious effort by Mary of Geese to secure the succession of the Scottish throne. And so she promises Mary, Queen of Scots, to the Dauphin of France. And this had been promised, you know, back in the 1540s, but, you know, Mary had been very, very young. So only now in the late 1550s is this starting to materialize as like a thing that will happen. And so the Lords of Congregation swear this covenant to each other. The Lords of Con Congregation being uh, Archibald Campbell, who's the Earl of Argyle and his brother, Alexander Cunningham, the Earl of Glencairn, James Douglas, the Earl of Morton, and John S. Keane of Dunn. And they decide that this, this marriage, if it's cemented, is going to be the end of them. So they have to move now. And they begin setting the pieces. They begin sending messages to England. And obviously in 1558, Elizabeth ascends the throne. Mary Tudor is dead. So England is once again Protestant and under a Protestant ruler who would have an interest in seeing this happen in Scotland. So now they're corresponding back and forth and they're beginning to move the pieces. And in 1559, they bring Knox back to Scotland at a point when they have sort of been moving to bring anger against the Roman Catholic church. And there, you know, there had been this longstanding anger, right? Uh, in certain circles that had existed for a while but they're sort of, they've been for these last two years stoking it and they've been trying to bring it about. And, and, and just, just to intercede there, sorry, but if you want more information on Mary and Elizabeth and the general political religious uh, situation in the kingdom at this time, then do check out our previous episode, which was uh, uh, lead up and events of the gunpowder plot uh, in which we quite extensively covered the reign of uh, Mary and the, um, the history of sort of prot cath, uh, uh back and forth uh in the period uh because that, that is it's it's quite complicated but we won't we won't go into it now because that would just it's, it's already complicated enough yes. and that's to say, on the bright side i am keeping up now as opposed to uh just directly learning through the uh through the fire hose uh, by all means please keep going i'm enjoying this all right so on the 11th of may 1559 knox preaches this fire and brimstone version on uh, the veneration of images and icons and the wickedness of Israel's refusal to fully destroy them back in the Old Testament. And basically this sermon stirs up a mob of people who are interested in now uh, cleansing the temple. So they go into these, these very famous churches and all the iconography they start destroying. And they start taking the churches and saying, we are going to reform the churches now. And this, of course, from the Lords of Congregation was a calculated move because it triggers royal forces to come in and restore order. And, and uh, just, just, just one other thing, the, the, uh, the, the kind of Machiavellian uh, playing of the game here is, is very, very good indeed, because I'm not quite sure oh, how we did clever. it. I'm not quite sure how we did it, but Knox and the other leaders of this somehow prevented the mob from harming any priests or friars or loyal Catholics, um, which of course means that there were no martyrs. Um, so there was never this, so they, they could kind of preemptively um, curtail 
certain kinds of backlash they might have by this way. Again, I'm not really sure how they did it because normally when you stir up a mob like that, people are going to get killed. But apparently, yeah, it's... it was bloodless um the monks, it's the monks very very fun. clever yeah i i don't know how they did it either but it was definitely like one of the chief things that they said is that we cannot we cannot under any circumstances allow for catholic martyrs we have to do this as much as possible bloodlessly and we have to play this perfectly so they trigger the sending of royal forces and the people who are sent is argyle and stewart but argyle and stewart were kind of like wink, wink, nod, nod on their side, and they, they get they get there right with the royal forces to the uh, to these churches, these keeps, and they switch sides. They deliver over their troops and they begin helping Knox and the Lords of Congregation raise an army for the inevitable French army that Mary of Guise is going to send, and. All over Scotland, this is like the hammer falls. This happens over and over and over again. These various churches go and quote unquote cleanse the temple, but they do not make any Catholic martyrs. I mean, it's really, it's frankly incredible that it happened the way that it did. Because just, you can't... sorry, sorry, Grant. Go ahead. Well, I, I was just going to say one of the ways that they managed to get around this is they actually. Um gave the monks permission to take what they could carry and then leave before they let yes. the mob go in. So the the soldiers of Argyle, for example, would say, okay, you've got two hours, clear out your stuff, and then we're entering. So they, they give them a little bit of time um, to get away before the mob can get in there. Yes. So, oh, and there is, I forget where it is in the old, or in the, New Testament in one of the Pauline epistle, epistles, there's this line that essentially says something to the effect of whatever you do, do in good order. And one of my pastors at the previous Presbyterian church I went to said, you know, mostly jokingly that the character of the Scottish people and of Presbyterianism could be summed up in that verse right there, which I thought was a funny line. Yeah, I mean, so far, it seems to be one of the only mobs in history that went into a gigantic iconoclastic fury and killed no one. Like, that's, a, yeah, exactly. that's impressive. Um, so, as, as expected, Mary of Geese enlists French aid, and the French and Scottish forces start fighting it out. Initially, the Lords of Congregation are extremely successful. They take Edinburgh, they march to Dundee and uh, Dunbar, but... 1800 French reinforcements are sent because the the French in this case are more or less like they're they're not quite betting all the cards but they're putting a lot here because this is strategically very very important and this is also why England is interested and this these French reinforcements essentially mean that the Scottish army even after all its help is really not going to be able to win in a fair fight but Again, Lords of Congregation have been moving for a while, and they enlist the help of the English, who march north and who are now trapping the French army between a Scottish army and an English army. And Mary of Geese, uh, and this is the other interesting thing, right? Like, the Lords of Congregation invite, essentially, an English army into Scotland I was, because of this war. I was about to say, like, if, if we're taking, like, the sort of, you know, you, you couldn't write history as a novel because it would be seen as too uh, either too on the nose or too insane to be to be published. You know, we started the story by uh, you know the Scots throwing off the shackles of the English, you know, gaining their their uh, long suffered independence and uh, you, know, you know establishing an independent church. And now here we are inviting the English in to uh, save the Scots. It's a uh, you couldn't write this just because people wouldn't believe it. It's awesome. Yep. And so this, because of the uh, English forces to the south, the Scottish forces to the north, and the French forces caught between them, there's this sort of stalemate. And Mary of Geese dies in 1560. And after her death, the French are more or less like, uh, we're not, you know, what, what's done is done here. We're ready to leave. And so the French negotiate for both an English and French exit from Scotland with both parties taking all of their forces and going home and leaving the Lords of Congregation in control, which is what happens. And the Lords of Congregation now go to 
Mary, Queen of Scots, who is still marrying the Dauphin and is still their rightful queen. And they tell her basically like, we will recognize you as monarch with full right to call parliament as long as you recognize that authority and ecclesiastical affairs is totally in our camp. And you have no ability to make rules as regards the reforming of Scotland or to interfere with our effort to reform it. And this is the covenant that is agreed. Mary, Queen of Scots, assumes the throne and the Reformation Parliament is called on the, for the 1st of August, 1560. That's a uh, remarkable culmination of events, given the uh, how other in other parts of the world at this point in time, if people do not know, uh, you would often have uh, you know attempted just total regicide, um, especially by the more radical elements. Uh, people might be aware of the Anabaptist mob that uh, the that Luther himself wrote against, uh, that were out for blood of nobles that uh, refused to take the sort of restored stance on the church. Um, you know, here seeing in the in Scotland, uh, perhaps as a result of the uh, royal influence over the church, seeing a settlement be created over who just gets to control what is really quite remarkable, um, especially with the demonstrated fervor by the uh, reformed population. Like we've talked about the iconoclastic fury with no martyrs. Uh, now we get to talk about sort of like the war that ends in just a religious settlement. You know, seems very uh, uh, remarkably orderly. Well, and to offer a quick anecdote from a century later, the English Civil War, which is a source of endless fascination for me. I'm a big uh, fan of that particular era. The Scottish who fight on the Parliament side in the English Civil War, they do not, they do not really have the same goals as the English parliamentarians fighting that war. They really only want a covenant from Charles saying that he will not interfere with the reforming of the Scottish church and the Scottish church. And when Charles is uh, forced into Scotland and signs this, this covenant, the national covenant with them, you know, they immediately switch sides and Cromwell is forced to go fight this war in Scotland with his former allies, because, you know, to them, they're really not, they're not anti-royalists. Like the Republican well, I guess you could say the anti-monarchical Republican character of Presbyterianism does not really come until it comes to America, and it is not really unique to Presbyterianism in that way. All righty, yeah. And it's interesting that you bring that up, uh, because especially given this panel, I'm sure that all four of us could talk about the English Civil War, and particularly that moment, for quite a long time. Um yeah, and I'm not trying to do that. Not, I'm not <laughs> but, trying to lead the discussion there. I promise. Right? No, no, I, I understand. Uh, but back to the uh, back to what we're uh, talking about here. There's a lot of poetic irony, like we were like we were talking about the English being invited after you know this whole thing started as a sort of uh, independence from the English, and now we are. Um, let me see if I can put this the correct way. Um, you get this sort of settlement between continental reformation and uh, national forces uh, that will eventually culminate in a uh, civil war where Scotland again has to fight to assert independence and once again gets invaded and uh, sort of brought into the fold. This is a, this is a, you know, this is one of the times where history turns into a more of a, more of an exercise in poetry than something of a, of a, you know, dry logical fact presentation. Which, well, indeed, indeed. Which, and hopefully now people can see perhaps why Carlyle would emphasize that, given his Scottish and Presbyterian nature. Uh, I mean, if this is your heritage and your history, uh, how can you view history as anything else but an exercise in poetry? Uh, this is a, you know, the, the main Reformation figure in Scotland went through his own version of the Odyssey, and this whole story just plays into like one giant epic. It's a uh, fascinating. But anyways, uh, I don't want to monopolize that part of the conversation. We have uh, plenty more to discuss, um, potentially, too, by the uh, other members of the panel. Is there anything more to add on this uh, well, sort of settlement? Let me just wrap this up real quick with the Reformed yeah. Parliament, okay. and then I'll hand it off. Um, the Reformed Parliament is called, and John Knox is given the ability to write what he would like to write. 
within reason. So he writes the Scots Confession and the Book of Discipline. And both of these, well, the Scots Confession will govern Scotland until the Westminster Confession of Faith during the English Civil War or in the aftermath of it. Uh, and the Scotch Confession is thoroughly Calvinistic. It is a fully Calvinist document, but it is not Presbyterian in a sense. Like the Calvinism that is adopted in this settlement is a Episcopal Calvinism rather than a Presbyterian Calvinism. Right. Uh, make your points without elaborating, and then we will uh, define okay. that. In the discussion. Like what? What are these terms? So just make the make the clear point what things were, and then we will define them. Okay. Uh, so Scott's confession was, you know, the adopted confession that the church set out of its doctrine, uh, Calvinist, uh, Episcopal, Presbyterian, the, the difference between Episcopal and Presbyterian government, Episcopal government is government by bishops, more top down Presbyterian government is more bottom up. It's not, you know, it's not democratic, but it is thoroughly Republican in nature. Uh, you know, the, the Scots Confession is adopted. The Book of Discipline, which is more Presbyterian, is not, largely due to financial concerns on behalf of a lot of the people about moving from Episcopal to Presbyterian church government. And, you know, that's that's pretty much how it goes. There's more that we could talk about, but this more or less, like, this sets the Reformation in Scotland in stone, and there isn't that much that changes from here on out. All right, and... Now, when I'm sure uh, Nathan Hood could st probably elaborate at great length about this, um, but just to give a basic working definition for people that are not, um, you know, autistic like some of us are with these sort of uh, church terms, um, as Mr. Brooks alluded to, um, an Episcopalian uh, church polity, basically how the church is organized, um, is from the top down. These are the groups that will use bishops, archbishops, uh, or, or variations thereof. Um, you have a very clear and defined hierarchy. Um, it's what the Roman Catholic Church uses. It's what the Anglican Church uses. Um, the Presbyterian uh, Church governance is governance by elders, where at least in the United States context, and I'm sure uh, both uh, Mr. Hood and Mr. Uh, Brooks could elaborate on this, um, each congregation will choose um, basically an elder, which acts as a basically as the head of that congregation, given the mandate uh, given by the congregation. Um, and then these elders can form councils, um, and you basically just organize from that uh, bottom point upwards. Um, you know, a congregation will elect elders, at least in the United States uh, form. Perhaps Scotland is uh, different eventually. Um, and then these elders go on to elect their superiors and so on and so forth. Um, uh, Mr. Brooks called it Republican. Um, and that is very true in the mo in the most uh, strict sense. Uh, you could also see this as almost aristocratic, not by birth, but by a uh, you know select minority of uh, potentially qualified people coming from each of their localities and rising through the ranks. Uh, so you get this sort of a uh, uh, I would say arist aristocratic republicanism, uh, not certainly not the republicanism that most people see as democracy nowadays. Uh, is any of that? Uh, unfair uh, to the uh, two Presbyterians that have uh, joined me today. Uh, is there any more elaboration? Uh, by all means, take it from there, gentlemen. I, I don't have any argument. I mean, when we talk about America specifically, we can add in maybe some of the uh, the peculiarities of that, but your characterization right. is pretty much correct. And and what this, uh, for Presbyterianism as it's being discussed in Scotland, not obviously not adopted, but the uh, factions there, is it any different? Uh, Mr. Hood, perhaps you would know. Yeah, so the, the thing is with Presbyterian in Scotland at this point is that you don't have presbyteries as such okay, at this point. Right. This is a later development about 20 or 30 years after the initial Reformation uh, by uh, led by a figure called Andrew Melville, who we'll come to, uh, I guess, uh, in, later on. And uh, the, he essentially says, okay, we've got um, Kirk sessions. So these are the parish church councils, which are made up of elders and the minister. You have the General Assembly, which is the national decision-making body, which is uh, congregations send maybe a, a minister and an, an elder too. But we don't have anything in the middle. We have synods, which are based on the old bishop system. 
uh, we have what were called superintendents. So these were no longer an attempt to replace the bishops with um, maybe a senior minister, but we don't have a, a collective. So presbyteries get developed with the second book of discipline in the 1580s. Um, and these are divided up region, regional based uh, groups of churches coming together. But what you'll find throughout this period is it, um, it oscillates whether the presbyteries have power or whether bishops, which are reintroduced in the 17th century by James VI, have power. And you actually have bishops becoming the moderators of presbyteries, the moderator being its chair. So you have this weird system of it's both Episcopalian and it's Presbyterian. And it's not until, well, not until 1690 that these issues finally are fully resolved in Scotland where with um, the glorious revolution, William of Orange confirming Presbyterianism as the religion of the Church of Scotland and Episcopalianism becoming a distinct church, that these, these two branches become distinct. So Presbyterianism is here, but it's, and there's a structure there, but it, there's this constant Episcopalian pushback within the church at this point. Right. So it's a uh, sort of hybridized just because, uh, mm. you know, neither are set in stone. You could say yeah, that yeah. Presbyterianism was being developed. Like it didn't okay, really right. reach its distinctive character until later. And, uh, for anyone, uh, that, you know, is new to this, that might be confused by some of the terms, usually, uh, presbyter, uh, sort of the root of Presbyterianism, Presby uh, Presbytery and all this other, all these other words. Uh, typically, you see presbyter directly translated to elder. Um, hopefully, that might clear some of the uh, some of the potentially archaic terms up for uh, those that don't really go delving into uh, what would it be New Testament Greek. Um, <laughs> uh, but, anyways, with these uh, with these uh, sides at play here, uh, so you have the more Episcopalian side, the Presbyterian side, but also the Roman Catholics. So if I'm on the ground, and I believe, Mr. Hood, you said this is your specialty, you know, what is this looking like? So, you know, I'm just a normal parishioner, uh, and I, you know, there are Catholics, Presbyterians, Episcopal or not Episcopalians as like a denomination, but, you know, those two that believe in those two different polities. Uh, what's going on? Like, are the Catholics being told to convert? Are they going off and splitting? Uh, how is this happening? Well... There's, there's kind of multiple answers to that. I, th I think on the on the broadly speaking, uh, we find and and maybe when we get to my my slides, we'll come into this a bit more. The there's a kind of soft reformation on the ground, I think, for a number of years, and uh, essentially the 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 default is you become a a reformed uh, Scot, and uh, there'll be various markers of identity which come with that. There is a Catholic minority, uh, certainly in Glasgow, for example, uh, there's a substantial Catholic minority. And this is in part because they're protected by various nobles within the system. And it's, it's if you have noble protection, the church can't really get you at this point. It requires yeah. the influence of the monarch. And uh, James was not too keen on persecuting Catholic monarchs. Indeed, he had uh, nobles, sorry. He had in many who were friends or he relied upon, and it was politically dangerous to do something like that where his position was quite fragile within Scotland. So uh, at this point, it's possible to remain a Catholic providing you've got the protection of your of your Lord, essentially. So, so there's minority pockets here and there, um, but the, the actual transition in the Scottish people, probably by 1519, 1600, you could say most would identify as reformed. What that, whether that means they're they're fully embracing Calvinist doctrine, is a is a different question. Okay, they would identify that way. Right, and uh, let me see. Matthew Barry here in chat has mentioned that the uh, Highland Lowland divide could mm -hmm. also influence this. Uh, is this because um, you know lords in the Highlands tended to protect? Uh, Catholics and the ones in Glasgow, or is that just because it was hard to reach uh, people in the Highlands, or is it both? Like, you know, uh, what's the reason here? It, it's a it's a mixture. I would say there are Catholic nobles in the South as well, okay. and they are also protected. Um, but it, it's it might not even be necessarily Highland, but rather Gallic and 
and lowland scots these are two different cultures mm, okay um, uh, and be- because somewhere like aberdeen isn't particularly gallic in its culture it's more like mainstream scotland but gallic culture which is shared with maybe the west coast of scotland uh parts of the highlands and ireland as well and you've got the irish sea as its kind of hub they speak a different language there's much more of this clan uh, association um where your fundamental loyalty is to your kin rather than maybe to scotland for example right um, this is the um, americans have like the scottish stereotype this is who they think of you know the people in the in the highlands that have a clan that wear kilts every day and have bagpipes and sword fights and all this other stuff stereotype obviously uh but mm-hmm. this is talking about this uh this gaelic uh nor or highland version of scots this culture group yeah this culture group and um, this this is hard to penetrate because of the language difference but then also um as we will see there's a well, well, how do you translate most of these texts which are coming from the Church of England and from the English-speaking congregation in Geneva? You need people who can speak both Gaelic and Scots or English and translate and are on board with the programme. Uh, and then also just the question of jurisdiction. So in major urban areas, you probably have like the local burgesses, the, the judges, they're supporting the Reformation effort. They're on the Kirk session. In these areas, you need the support of the local laird or noble and often they were not on board uh, so so this becomes a big issue for these areas and as we will see with the ulster plantation there are considerable efforts to try and essentially destroy this culture um both for political and for religious reasons i see so so then the characterization that one would be much more reformed than the other is not false then sorry could you repeat that uh, the characterization that one of these cultures, uh, you know, the lowlands, uh, would be much more uh, reformed than the other, the highland or the Gaelic, uh, that's not a false characterization, then. No, I, I think that's fair. I think that's fair. I would, I, and I think Spinley makes this point in the chat. It's not highlands, lowlands, it's western east or Gallic okay, and right. Scots, yes. So, so somewhere like Aberdeen uh, is probably quite reformed. Uh, there's There's been some good work on that uh, recently. Um, but it is different from the lowlands in some other aspects. But the Gallic aspect is is distinct from somewhere like Aberdeen, which is in the far north of Scotland. Right. Okay. So, uh, with that being said, does anyone have anything else? Uh, all right. Um, so, uh, Grant, you mentioned to me earlier that whenever we got to stuff on the ground, we would sort of uh, you know, see time to uh, Nathan Hood. I don't know what you two had planned for that, so I, uh, I'm i going to hand this sort of over to you two to uh, decide who is talking about what. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm, I didn't have time to research as much like the actual way that, you know, worship and liturgy changed so much, and because of my uh, I guess you could say experience in Presbyterianism here in America, there's actually wide variation um, I mean, you know, there, there is a fundamental continuity, but there's a lot of variation in the way that it looks. So in terms of how it looked in the Reformation, especially in its tender period and even in the lead up and continuation, uh, you know, I didn't know how much Nathan knew, but I sort of figured that I would defer to him and sort of saying what it was like for the average parishioner, how things were changing in that way. So um, in that case then uh mr hood you have presented a variety of uh pictures and photos are we at the point in time the sort of uh you know the reformation being sort of firmly established not clarified because we saw these two different groups of episcopals and uh episcopalians and presbyterians are we at the point to where you'd be ready to uh discuss all of that do we need to go farther uh yeah no that sounds great that sounds great um, right, do you I want will... me to share that share it on my screen well, or it's up to you because if I do it on mine, uh, we have this is what it would look like. Excellent. But, yeah. If you want to do it, then by all means you can too. Okay, that's great. That's great. And I'll just tell you when to to move on to the next slide. Yeah. So, um, so leading straight off from from uh, what Grant has said, uh, 
at the outset of the Reformation, you have this Reformation Parliament, which establishes the Scots Confession. You've also got uh, the introduction of the form of prayer. So this is the text used by Knox in the English-speaking congregation in Geneva. He brings this across with him as the new liturgy for the Church of Scotland. Uh, and you also have the Book of Discipline, which, while it's not approved by Parliament, does become the kind of um, unofficial structural direction for the church moving forward, at least in kind of disciplinary matters and such like. But as was mentioned, the reason why the Book of Discipline was rejected was because it was essentially going to restore church property revenues, so the benefices that we were talking about, to local congregations, to the minister who was there. They would be able to fund then a preaching ministry across Scotland. However, nobles, many of these lords of congregation and their supporters, wanted these benefices or these revenues for themselves and actually were able to claim many of these church lands after the Reformation. So what you end up with then is the Church of Scotland, as it's reformed, is unable to find to employ or bring many ministers into the church because they have no money. They have no money to pay most of these people with. Additionally, we talked about education. One of the key emphasis here is that only ministers are ordained to preach the word and deliver the sacraments. We'll get into the, the kind of nuances of those things later. But for that, you require a university education, typically a degree of some kind, followed by theological training. Um, there wasn't a ready supply of these people at 1560. So what you actually find is they limit parish worship to what was called the reader service or the first part of the service. A reader wasn't ordained, but they were somebody who was uh, elected or chosen by the local congregation and local ministers to lead the, the service in three ways. They couldn't preach and they couldn't deliver the sacraments, but first and foremost, they could read the Bible. What we've got, what we've got on the screen here is a picture of the Geneva Bible, and this was, or the English translation, and this is what was used in the Church of Scotland during this time. And what's important to, to think about here is the interpretive mode that was most used was what we might call the regulative principle. And this is the idea that unless something is explicitly sanctioned by scripture, then it's not allowed within the church. So this is right. quite a different interpretation from saying, oh, well, um, if, it, if, it's not in script, if it's not prohibited by scripture, then we can do it. This is saying, no, it has to be actually permitted by the Bible. It must be sanctioned by the Bible. Right. And for, uh, I will often get the, uh, question, you know, what's the most obvious or the uh, biggest difference? What, you know, why do these, uh, you know, a lot of these, uh, hardline Calvinists look so different from other Protestants. Uh, usually it goes back to this principle among other things, but this is usually the most obvious, uh, one, you know, how do you read scripture mm -hmm. unless it is uh, properly given to you, you either can't do it or, or, or you, uh, you can't do it unless it's properly given to you or, you know, is it prohibited? No. Well, then you can do it. You know, those two uh, differences of uh, philosophy uh, tend to be, you know, if I get like five minutes to answer that question, how I will answer it. But uh, by all means, keep going. Uh, I just figured I would have outlined the importance of that. Well, and if I may interject here, this, the regulative principle is one of these things that is probably one of the biggest dividing lines between you know, your hardline Presbyterians and other Calvinists, because, you know, this, this has a pretty, you know, pretty market effect. Like, are you going to have an organ in your church? Well, the regulative principle obviously would not permit you to do so. And so there's actually uh, in the American context, wide disagreement about this. I don't know if any of you were familiar with Char or uh, Robert Dabney, who's probably the most famous of the uh, American Presbyterians in the South, but he has this essay where he like eviscerates the idea of using an organ in church as like one of the most Romish things possible, which, you know, to me is very interesting because I currently attend a Presbyterian church with a beautiful pipe organ that I'd be very sorry to see go. So it's, it's a serious point of contention, this regulatory uh, principle 
And in America specifically, it has a lot of impact on American Christianity generally. That's that's really helpful. And as you'll see, all of the things that we find in the worship of your average Scottish parish at this point are going to be directed by this principle too. So that's the f justification for all that we see going forward. The, the other thing just on uh, the reading of the Bible as well, so obviously this is being in the, read in the vernacular, and it's um, they'll read the Old Testament in terms of this frame of the national covenant that we've been speaking about. So there's this belief, and Knox was very strong on this, that Scotland has, like Israel, been given a special relationship with God, and that the it becomes a covenanted nation and all its members, all the people of Scotland are to take God as their God and they are to be his people. So when they're reading the Old Testament, these many of these passages can be applied to the state of Scotland too. And you see that with things like public fasting and so on. Um, could you move it to the next slide, please? Yeah, so this is this is a, a nice picture of a, a burial chamber in Fife that we were referring to earlier. And it brings us to the, the kind of second area of what the reader could do, which is lead the congregation in collective prayer. For a bit of context here, during the high mass in parish worship of the medieval period, while the, the priest was performing the mass in Latin, the congregation would be expected to engage in their own individual or private prayers using the Book of Hours or various primers. They wouldn't have joined with the priest in a collective prayer together. But in the form of prayers that are being used, the reader or the minister would, from, would at the front, lead the whole congregation in a joint prayer together, often of confession of various kinds. Now, while the, the form of prayers does give example ones that could be used, it wasn't like the Book of Common Prayer in England, which has very set words that are meant to be said by the, the priest and then by the congregation. Rather, there was a degree of freedom for, for the reader or the minister to, to be moved by the spirit, we might say. There's a strong emphasis on extemporary prayer. As right. long as it's within these sorts of guidelines and hitting various points, then it could be quite quite dynamic and idiosyncratic. That's uh that's something you can still see in a lot of the uh low church or, pro or low and mm. mid church. I don't know what you call the middle in that terminology, uh, where they will insist on generating their own prayers, and you get the stuck up high church types that mm. uh, insist on uh, using something already written. Um, that is something that you very much can still see today. And all it takes is to go into, you know, uh, your average sort of either Baptist or uh, average Presbyterian church. And if uh, someone offers to pray, very rarely will they break out a book. They will just, uh, you know, start speaking. And then if you go, for instance, to a you know, sort of the more high church Lutheran types, uh, the prayers will be pre-written, uh, mm. which uh, I always... Uh, found the expectation to come up with your own prayer rather annoying because I'm terrible with coming up with something uh, uh, good on the spot. <laughs> so uh, that that was a personal bias of mine against it. Uh, absolutely nothing as to how true or good or whatever it is. That was just I, uh, you know, I, it's something I recognized, which is always a uh, fun while uh, studying history. Well, in the American character, Presbyterianism like leans into this even, I would say, perhaps more than the Scottish one, because early early Presbyterianism in America, they're almost all educated at Yale. You know, obviously you need the university degree in Presbyterianism. That is something that uh, we hold to that. There's some funny stories about that later on related to America. But the, the point being, Yale was under the New England Congregationalists who were also Calvinists and were pretty close to the Presbyterians, but, you know, pretty close on doctrine, but they had a huge emphasis on spontaneity, vital impulse, adaptability, and experiential piety. And because of this, obviously, that would make them very, very uh, loath to use pre-planned prayers. Right. So I, I just figured I'd bring that up, Ming, as you mentioned it. Um, 
Uh, and one of the things I always hate hearing is uh, how does this history have any bearing on what's happening now when you can, uh, there's so many different little nooks and crannies that you can see, you know, that still exist today. So by all means, please keep going. And uh, well, um, could, could you move it to the next slide, please? So, so this is actually a painting from a house in Edinburgh during this period. It would have been on a, on a wall of Cain and Abel. Uh, but one of the reasons why I've included it is you've got this uh, burning pyre before uh, Abel. And there was this strong sense within collective prayer that the way that the congregation would join with the prayers of the minister, the minister was the only one allowed to, to speak this extemporary prayer, but they must join with their hearts, with their emotions, with the contrite heart, which is like a burning sacrifice to the Lord, uh, whether that's in sorrow or in... Um, exaltation. And this would manifest physiologically. There was a very strong emphasis on bodily expression of emotion to join in. So you'll often find uh, examples of congregations weeping, the tears understood to be the true speech of the heart to the Lord, or groaning, groaning in desire for God. Now, I mention this in part because the, certainly in Scotland today, you would not go into a church of Scotland and, and uh, witness people crying and groaning in prayer. This is, this is often more associated with uh, charismatic groups in Scotland today. Uh, so as you're saying, Ryan, it, 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 um, you can see the connections in very different ways. Um, but, the, but the other reason I wanted to include it as well is, um, so with the regulative principle, we've seen already that there's a strong bout of iconoclasm in Scotland and parish churches by and large, eliminate images all over the place. There, there is no place for images within the Scottish parish church. However, what we find is in domestic dwellings, it's quite common to find these sorts of paintings, uh, both, both in terms of, uh, so it's so mainly Old Testament scenes, not New Testament, although there are a couple of examples. Uh, and these would be used for essentially education and spiritual meditation. So whilst the, and it's only really with the Covenanters that we find an even stronger form of iconoclasm, which had problems with this kind of imagery. During this period, as long as it's not within the church and you're not using it as an object of worship or adoration or as a means of worship, then, then it's okay. Um, right, and the, this yeah. uh, form of culture, even though most of the American culture is not uh, explicitly this form of Calvinism, uh, you, typically you'll have a, what would be the word, Arminianism or you know, the Baptist uh, version of all of this. Um, this does sort of carry over. Very often, if you were to just walk into like just any average American church, like if you were to just pick one out of a hat and walk into it, um, the only images you might see are, you know, stained glass windows. And even then, those are usually new additions. If you go to definitely to a much older church from the colonial period, uh, most likely there is no image inherently built into the church. Uh, usually the walls are bare. Uh, you know, you have the wooden pews. It's sort of what people imagine whenever you think of like the Puritan church or whatnot, uh, which can be right or wrong. You can dispute that. But that's uh, typically what the average looks like on the uh, sort of older in definitely. Um, however, in most people's houses in the United States, especially if you have a, a if you have the heritage of your family, uh, you might notice a lot of religious imagery that just gets passed down and displayed in houses. Uh, you know, a weak example, but one that's very common would be crosses. But uh, I know definitely some of the older members of my family, despite the fact that they would never, you know, have crucifixes or anything like that in their church, uh, will keep paintings or will paint themselves, you know, uh, displays of Christ on the cross or Old Testament scenes like, uh, you know, the offering, uh, Cain and Abel presenting their offerings to God is one that comes up. The Binding of Isaac is another one. Uh, this does carry over not strongly, not directly, uh, but I can't help but see that, uh, you know, there's a sort of genealogy here, if you will. And I would be shocked if this isn't uh, one of the uh, influences on it. This is arguably, you know, the regulative principle is arguably the influence, particularly like in America, 
Presbyterianism, uh, Calvinism generally, you know, it dominates the colonial sphere, but uh, as the country moves west, it really gives way, and there are a variety of reasons for that that we don't have time to get into in this stream. But the even though Calvinism fades, the regulative principle does not. American Christianity is very, compared to Europe, is extremely iconoclastic. And there is this dispute, you know, within Presbyt or within Protestantism about the second commandment, or I guess from the uh, the Lutheran or Catholic con uh, numbering conventions, it'd be the first commandment, uh, about whether this forbids the creation of images for worship or whether this forbids the creation of images at all. And these are really the only two positions in America until relatively recently. Like the idea of... Uh, you know, images at all being in churches is just something that is, for the most part, very alien to Americans. It still is. Like, if you go to the average uh, Lutheran church and you say that you want to, uh, uh, you know, start displaying things like crucifixes or stuff like that, uh, like just using a very Catholic example, you will get told you are too Catholic and uh, you, know, you widely be ostracized. This is still a cultural force, uh, you know images uh at all or you know some images used for worship so uh you know don't un don't undersell yourself here so so um bef before we move on from this painting i just wanted to raise a point about the uh, the tension with the calvinist theology of the period and the national covenant idea because and you'll see why i'm connecting it to this painting in a second with, with the Calvinist uh, idea of the elect and the reprobate being sp split, and there's no, there's no crossing over between the two lines, we find in a lot of iconography of the period, in houses or in books and whatnot, of this, this very sharp division between somebody like Abel and Cain, representing the two groups. But of course, in a national church, uh, so... so Sorry to row back a second. When you get to the like New England, this is brought into effect very strongly with the congregations essentially testing people before they become members of their of their churches, and so you have in a sense the best guess you can get at who is in who is elect. In a national church like the Church of Scotland, it's not possible to divide mem based on membership who's in and who's out. And I think this painting reflects that in the sense that Cain and Abel are not actually divided down the middle of the painting. Actually, there's a you can see a sense of movement here where Cain and you could interpret him in a contrite way, moving towards Abel and the restoration process. So there's a different dynamic in Scotland, I think, uh, and the tension around that. And beca because of this, there's a there's a hope that everybody can can come to repentance essentially right and that's a i really like the sort of analysis that you gave here it's not perfectly split down the middle because if you see other reformation artwork uh lucas cronach the elder comes to mind mm. he will make use of that he will split a painting down the middle to uh either demonstrate you know law and gospel through two different sides of the painting uh he will split it down the middle to show like sin and redemption and all this other stuff uh but the fact that you don't see that here, when it would be very easy to do that, uh, I like that. I like that symbolism. Uh, thank you for that point there. <laughs> uh, so, if we move on to the the next slide, so here we come to the third thing that the reader could lead us in, and that is psalm singing. So, in the late medieval church, uh, uh, sorry, before before I mention that. I should say Scotland was a musical culture, much like most of early modern Europe at this time. It was quite common for balladeers to be singing in the marketplace and for people given the oral rather than literary culture to pick up tunes and songs quite easily and sing them at work or in the tavern and so on. And it, there was this, th we shouldn't just see this as popular actually, uh, stuff being sung in court will often disseminate around the country and likewise folk tunes are coming up into the court and and whatnot so there, there's a lot of singing going on except in the, the parish church or in the late medieval context congregations did not sing it might be the priest or if if they're a wealthier church a choir too 
but the congregation wouldn't have sung during the Mass. Congregational psalm singing, which is inspired by the Genevan practice, is brought in in 1564. It's a, it's a distinctive metrical psalter. It's not just a copy of the English one or the Genevan one. It uh, uses, it has all 150 psalms set to 105 melodies, which are syllabic. So each note matches a syllable. It's in the vernacular. It has simple phrasing and rhythms and pitches. So they're not very difficult pitches to sing. And these psalms become a mainstay. They weren't always intended to be the essential music of the church. They're not seen as in the Scots Confession as essential or in the Book of Discipline. But by the 17th century, eyewitnesses report that the vast majority of Scots knew some or all of the Psalter off by heart. And this is their primary engagement with the word. It must have been a very revolutionary experience singing as a community, the same words together once you've just been praying, expressing very powerful emotions and the melodies themselves. So I mentioned 105 tunes. This is the most of any Psalter at this point. And this is because the authors of this, this um, Psalter wanted the tunes to reflect the lyrical content in its emotionality. So um, something like Psalm 51 takes a certain mode which is connected with sorrow, and it sounds sorrowful, whereas Psalm 100, which uh, many of you will know is the, the old hundredth that we sing now, it is jubilant and triumphant and sets forth the glory of God. So this dynamic's there too. They're using the emotionality of music to instill the meaning of the psalm within the congregation. So it, Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, go, go, ahead. go ahead. I was just going to say, this is also something that has been adopted by quite a large array of Protestantism. If I were to go to my bookshelf over there and pull out my hymnal, um, you know, the first uh, small section of it, probably the first tenth of the book, is the Psalter uh, divided in uh, with the uh, Psalms divided into, um, you know, different areas that are supposed to be uh, chanted or sung on a specific tune. Uh and in fact, at the United States event uh, this last uh, February, uh, that's what we engaged in, is we sang psalms out of the Psalter uh, to you know, various different tunes that are uh, derived to uh, express emotions. I, uh, the one that I have isn't nearly elaborate with, uh, what was it, over 100 uh, tunes that you were uh, uh, talking about there. We have, like I think, uh, 10, something like that. Um, but they, they each correspond to a different emotion. Like one is definitely more sorrowful and contemplative. Uh, another one is much more jubilant. One is uh, more sort of wistful, if you will. Uh, but you know, th this is something that you see in other parts of Protestantism as well, and something that I'm very uh, grateful for, just because it is a wonderful expression. You aren't uh, you're not just exaggerating for uh, you know uh, presentation reasons or anything like that, or personal bias. This is genuinely a beautiful activity to engage in. Uh, chanting and singing psalms. Well, and, and uh, figures like Calvin, who influenced this practice, talked about uh, psalm singing stirring the heart or setting it aflame in prayer to God. And that was really the aim of that. Um, I, I'm conscious of time, so I've well, I've, I've linked to an article in the, the chat that I wrote about this, that if people want to explore more about, that's, uh, that's fine. But, I um, will uh, copy that and send it out. By all means, keep going. Oh, no, no, I've put it in the YouTube chat. Sorry. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. oh well, in that case, it works. <laughs> uh, so um, if we scroll on to the uh, next slide, just very briefly. Yes, this, this is just a painting from the time, again, from a, a local um, house in Edinburgh. And uh, it depicts King David with the Psalms in front of him. I can't help but feel he looks a lot like James the Sixth here. Uh, it, I feel like he's trying to butter up the monarch, um, but uh, yes, yes. And uh, so, so what we've got here is we've got Bible reading, prayers, and psalm singing, and these are the three things that, for the first thirty years, you could guarantee if you went into a church of Scotland, you would find. That's what you've got. So none of these things are teaching Protestant doctrine directly. They're not uh, a minister standing at the front 
preaching on predestination, right? But they are Protestant activities insofar as vernacular Bible reading, collective prayer, and psalm singing are things which you wouldn't have found in the late medieval high mass. And so what we're seeing is that, that's why I called it a soft cultural reformation for the first 30 years. They're not getting kind of taught um, explicitly Protestant ideas, but they're engaged in Protestant practices. And these become then badges of their religious identity and national identity. It's only with the 1590s and the 17th century that across most urban areas and certainly the lowland Scots or the, the mainstream Scottish culture that we see ministers coming into pulpits, in part because there's more finance for it at that point. So if we move on to the next slide, here we find the key part of furniture, the pulpit, uh, which would have replaced the altar at the centre of the parish church. There wasn't much church building during this period because of the lack of resources. They're just repurposing the parish church often. And it would be the minister, an ordained minister, who would be the preacher, preaching uh, for about an hour to two hours on a passage within the Geneva Bible. These ministers would have had all of them are university education at one of the uh, five universities of Scotland at this period. So you've got St. Andrews, Glasgow and King's College Aberdeen, which exists from the medieval era. There's two Protestant uh, um, churches with um, universities which are founded, uh, Edinburgh and Marshall in Aberdeen as well. And all of these will become centres for ministers for training predominantly a classical slash Aristotelian education, but with Andrew Melville, who comes from the back from the continent, he's been working in France for a long time, he brings a uh, humanist emphasis on languages and learning uh, ancient languages to read the Bible in its original form. So you could, you could find many ministers fluent in uh, Greek and Hebrew, and some even in in languages like Aramaic as well. Oftentimes, we mentioned with prayer that there, are, there aren't set prayers. Well, neither are there set sermons. You're not supposed to write down your sermon. Actually, it's meant to be extempore. So often, th this was possible in part because you'd be working through a book of the Bible verse by verse each week. So you're broadly within the same theological area as you have been preaching on for multiple weeks and of course they're relating a lot of it to covenant theology more broadly so every in scotland you find most ministers will re see every passage as relating to uh, the story of salvation uh, the covenant of works and the covenant of grace so that's that d helps with this extempore emphasis because I don't know about you, but preaching for two hours uh, without without a plan in front of me would be quite difficult. Um, maybe you guys could do it. I, uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I've already said I uh, struggle to come up with uh, something good on the spot. So that would be, uh, you know, if you were to write out, you'd have a book for each sermon or, uh, you know, you just have to be really good. Uh, it's quite impressive that this is a this is the practice. It definitely takes a certain type of person. I could... I could preach for two hours, but I would be very worried about what I said in that two hours if I had to go that long. Right, right. And uh, well, I, I guess I guess the, the catch here is, well, many of the ministers would wait till they felt moved by the Holy Spirit as well. So they believe that what they're preaching is coming directly from or being moved by God in, the, in their minds and in their souls. Uh, so and, and you'll even see somebody like Robert Rollock, who was the principal of the University of Edinburgh, saying the, the minister's words, if they're you know, faithful to scripture, are essentially the word of God in this place. Uh, you should take it with that authority. So it, it's a very powerful thing, uh, the, the preaching here. Um, right. uh, definitely shouldn't, can't be uh, understated then if that's the case the uh, role that it has. Right, right. And um, 
just just before we move on from this this pulpit, you'll see on the side here, on the right hand side, it, it's not connected to the pulpit now, but there's a little kind of metal bracket. Do you, um below yeah, the kind uh, of this right here. Yeah, so just above that is where the sand glass would be, the hour timer. And then that would have been attached to the pulpit, and that's where the font would be for baptism. And it would be directly connected to the pulpit. It's this idea that the sacraments, so there's a reduction of the sacraments from seven to two, baptism and the Lord's Supper. And these are understood as signs and seals of the word of God. They are essentially the same thing. They offer Jesus Christ and his benefits, but they are visible forms or tangible forms. We'll get into more detail about that with the Lord's Supper. Right. But and that's, this... that's consistent across most Protestantism, that, uh, that description, mm. save for... Uh, those that believe it only to be a symbol, uh, which is there, which that's a specific group. Right. Yes. And uh, so the, the, the significance here is that by placing the baptismal font onto the pulpit, you're saying this is, this proceeds from the word of God. It is the same thing. You can, and this goes against the practice uh, of baptizing infants in the home, for example outside of a context where a sermon might be preached. So, so it's very theologically significant. Uh, can, can we move to the next slide? Yeah, the gown. Oh, the gown, the gown. So <laughs> <laughs> this, so the Scots Confession identifies three rather than two marks of the visible church. The right preaching of the word of God, the right administration of the sacraments and ecclesiastical discipline. And as far as I'm aware, it's the only reformed church during this period to include discipline as one of its key marks. Yeah, uh, the Lutheran ha Lutherans have the other two. And I know that that's the same for a lot of the continental reform, but I don't recall seeing discipline. And it's not in Geneva either. So this is a unique thing to Scotland, which maybe tells you something about the temperament of, uh, of John Knox. But uh, the... Essentially, we, we mentioned earlier Kirk sessions, these courts or councils that run the, the local parish. And usually it's staffed by the middle classes, as Grant was talking about. These are um, your burgesses, your lawyers, merchants and so on. Significant people within the community. And they're led by the minister who himself is from a university background. So another middle class person. And essentially as part of uh, administering their duties, they would discipline those who committed what were called public offenses or public sins. Things like murder would go to uh, proper courts, but for lower misdemeanors, things like adultery or fornication, gossiping or uh, insulting, brawling, this would be the forum in which these things would be dealt with and disciplined. The process for this was quite um, quite robust. The, the committee would call forward a person who was accused of this sort of thing, and they would um, secure eyewitnesses to prove or disprove an allegation. Once an allegation was proved, they would then move towards disciplinary measures. And essentially there's, there's kind of two parts to this. Uh, and for those of you who know late medieval practice, there's a lot of continuity with public penance from that period. It's probably the thing which stays most closely the same. Uh, on the one hand, you have to make satisfaction for what you've done, temporal satisfaction. You've committed a sin, which was, let's say, worth so much pleasure, so fornication. So you must do an equivalent amount of uh, punishment, uh, usually of some kind of pain, to undo that pleasure or to pay it off. So, uh, for example, it was quite common for fornicators to be chained around the neck outside of the, the church during some time during the week or on the market cross. And they would have to stand there in sackcloth and people might throw rotten food at them or, or whatnot. But yes, that that would be part of it. Or for gossips or, or slanderers, there was a something called the Scots Bridal, which was a cage which went over the head and had a little implement that went into the mouth, silencing the mouth. 
and so you, you can also bridling the tongue essentially and you might have to wear that in public for a while you would probably have a label saying the nature of your sin and perhaps hold an object connected to it so if you had attacked somebody with a sword you might be holding a wooden implement a wooden dagger with a bit of red painted on it we have examples of that so that's one side of discipline the other side sorry ryan go ahead no, i was just going to ask is this the same tradition where uh i know in america this is the puritan so english tradition uh, but is this the sort of same line of philosophy where, say, branding adulterers came from, where you would uh, take a branding iron with an A and, uh, you know, brand them somewhere on their body? Uh, or same same thing with the other letters, uh, the first letter of their uh, offense, you just brand them. Is this the same sort of uh, philosophy that leads to that, or is that a different uh, generation? No, this, this is the same, and actually branding was an, another level up if they continue to be obstinate in their engagement with the Kirk session. So if they continue to resist uh, discipline, then they might, you might receive branding. Yes. All righty. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's quite a serious Perfect deal. Brand. <laughs> <laughs> well, and if we tie this back into like American literature, a part of resistance, right. In the classic Hawthorne story, uh, Scarlet letter, you know, the adulteress refuses to give up, the person that she's in adultery with right because he's the pastor so. right which yeah that, that is the a major part of the story and uh, i'm not concerned about spoiling anything uh there uh <laughs> i can't imagine that that is just an example related to um fiction or relegated to fiction uh so who would be uh, carrying out the punishments and the disciplines? Would it be the pastor or would it be a set person or committee or whatnot? Uh, just well, as a question. Well, you see, the, the Kirk session would have, so elders and the minister, many of these elders would have also doubled up as civic uh, people in important civil offices in in the local area. So maybe the Burgesses. So they would be responsible for uh administering punishments anyway so it quite it quite nicely ties up the two institutions here of the the spiritual sphere and the temporal sphere in administering the these um disciplines so they would be responsible yes very cool all righty and that was the only interjection i had uh you bet you said there was another uh another oh, okay. okay so well j just before that just to say i think i think what's really key to see here is that this punishment um, is designed to humiliate the offender and inflict pain upon them as a way of almost um, well it, it's it's uh, preventative in the sense that people watching on do not want this to happen to them and it marginalizes those who do break the codes or do break the kind of behaviors that are expected so it's a way of reinforcing the moral order uh, through humiliation, embarrassment, and shaming. But the other side of it is offenders were not just left in this situation. They had to engage after they had done their satisfaction in public repentance, where they would be often in sackcloth or some kind of poor linen. They would be, mar they would be excluded from public worship during their time of offense until they were had a, done it all and then on that day they would be marched in during just before the sermon and they would have to sit in front of the congregation on the cutty stool or the stool of repentance we could see one there so they would be in full view of the whole congregation who we must not uh, forget also walk past them outside of the church uh, on their way in so even more embarrassment and, and shame here but then after the the sermon the minister would then turn to the the offender and start well ask them for a confession of their sins before the congregation this they would do on their knees um essentially saying in quite specific detail what they had done and that they were con that they had sorrow for their sin and desired mercy from god often with tears 
And then they would engage in a kind of back and forth with the minister, maybe interrogating them a bit more. Then the, the minister would turn to the congregation and he would ask them if they thought that the penitent was truly penitent, whether he had genuine contrition. If so, then they would say, well, as far as we can see, you are absolved of your sins by God. But if not, then they would have to do more satisfaction. So perhaps the biggest change here is where is in the practice of confession, the priest is the one who administers absolution. Here the congregation does. Right, yeah. And and this is much more of a uh, public confession as well. Uh, although although you would have had public penance in the in the Catholic Church as well. Right. It's just I also notice um whenever uh Whenever uh, certain uh, I don't know, high church Protestants in the modern era will talk about, you know, the importance of private confession, uh, mm. typically there's quite a large strand of American evangelicalism, Protestantism, that will, you know, decry it as Catholic, for better or worse. Like, I'm not here to argue theology, but that is just what happens. Um, and I feel like the, their objections would make more sense if this form of public confession was offered in return, as opposed to... Uh, you know, usually nothing being offered is just assume that you do it privately, which, you know, barely anyone around here does. Um, but but I, I feel like that there's a, this is an element that it feels like a large part of American Protestant society, or perhaps Scottish as well, but I can't, I'm not qualified to speak on that, uh, was built around and we just no longer have it anymore. Well, and this ties into uh, stuff about America, particularly that I'll get to later. Right. Okay. Uh, but that, that was the only thing I had here. Awesome. And j just to say as well, I, I didn't mention it before, but this in many parishes was quite regular. You, in, in Certainly in urban areas from quite early on, you're getting this every week, seeing penitents and offenders on, on the stool. So particularly focused on uh, fornication, because that's something that regardless of your theological views at this time, you can agree is a bad thing. And it's only later that you you see a branching out of into other sins uh, in the 1590s and so on. Uh, so can we move? Uh, sorry, Ryan, you were going to say something. No, no, I, I was just uh, I was just asking if that was the uh, the point there. So so now we come to the to communion to the Lord's Supper, as it would have been called, and. There's often this impression that actually uh, reforms, reformed Protestantism in Scotland was logocentric, that it focused on the word and the sacramental character of the medieval church was largely lost. But what we actually find is that the liturgical calendar is focused around the Lord's Supper in very important ways, uh, not least because there was an, an intention, whether the, it was possible to carry it out or not, it's a different question, intention to celebrate it four times a year, which, although the Mass was celebrated weekly, uh, la the laity participated generally in High Mass only once a year at Easter. So there was an, in, there was an intention of increasing engagement. The way that it was practiced uh, was, as we've been talking about the regulatory principle, as close as possible to the depiction of the Last Supper as they they saw it. So you have it. So this this in painting here, which is of John Knox delivering communion, they would sit round a table rather than kneel before an altar or or anything like that. And the uh, uh, objects used, and I, th I think um, we'll see in a later slide the objects, they would try to get ordinary or quite ordinary uh, plates and cups for it. The uh, The actual ceremony would involve the minister reading the institution uh, from, from Corinthians and then uh, distributing the elements around the table. So the various parishioners taking part there would be handing it around themselves as well. Uh, not everybody could participate from the community, though. You had to, to pass a test of uh, your knowledge of the Lord's Prayer, the Ten Commandments, and of the Apostles' Creed, which 
every week they would be educated on in catechesis classes uh, in the afternoons on Sabbaths. Uh, and also, if you were a public offender during this period, you wouldn't have been allowed to permit either. So we could maybe see in the Lord's Supper a gathering of those recognized as being part of the true church in that respect, those who have been recognized by the church as having faith. So maybe this is where we see more of a parallel with New England Puritan congregations. Right, yeah. And I was, I was about to say, not even Puritan congregations. What you're describing here, save for the Apostles' Creed having to be recited, uh, this seems uh, very uh, similar to what I experienced as a Baptist, uh, because that, that was the church that I grew up in and wasn't until about 2018 or so. Um, you know, practice seems very similar. Um, you get... Uh, if not exactly from uh, Corinthians, you get something very similar to the words of institution. Um, and then typically what would happen is elders would bring it to the congregation, and then the congregation would pass it around, uh, usually down pews or something like that, not the table, as was uh, mentioned here, which seems like a big detail. Uh, but uh, most American churches that I've come across don't have the table, so I I'm sure we will get into that difference soon. Um, but it would be passed around the congregation, um, and you would basically have to ensure to the people there that you <laughs> were basically paying attention. You know, do you know your Ten Commandments? Do you know the Lord's Prayer? You know, we go over this stuff constantly, so you should know it. Um, uh, but this, this all seems similar. Uh, this seems to be a very, uh, especially for the American South with the Baptist, the Presbyterian influence probably going up into Appalachia and the parts of the Midwest or the Great Plains, rather, not the Midwest, um, seems seems pretty standard. Uh, this seems like a very direct influence, but I could be entirely wrong. There could be a different genesis for this. I, I don't know. I don't know. But, well, we'll come to a possible connection very, very shortly. Um, so if we move to the next slide, which is, uh, it, it hasn't come out too well, but the, there is a heart within that uh, chalice that she's holding there. And again, this is from another painted uh, ceiling in um, the west coast of Scotland this time. I just wanted to comment briefly on the sacramental theology here, because as you alluded to, Ryan, so some, well, so some have, have seen the practice in Scotland as purely symbolical memorial, in that the the... There is no um, extra spiritual activity going on. The elements are, are not transformed into the body and blood of Christ. It is, it's a remembering, it's a ceremony which remembers what Christ did in the Passion. However, in Scotland, this is explicitly re rejected in the Scots Confession and actually, and is widely um, preached by many ministers that what's going on is there is a real presence of bo Christ's body and blood in the sacrament. However, the elements are not transformed uh, into the, the body and blood. Rather, there is a sacramental conjunction of the physical acts or the, the acts going on in the church and Christ's deliverance of his body and blood to those who have faith. So when you eat the, the wafer or the bread, and it would have been an ordinary loaf as well uh, to kind of emphasize the ordinariness of this meal. The um, at the same time, Christ is feeding you His body through through your spiritual mouth, which is faith. Right. So uh, there's a parallel activity going on on two spheres. Right. Doesn't that usually get called like pneumatic presence or something like that? Spiritual presence or is spiritual that spiritual presence? It's yeah, we're we're treading into water here that is extremely contentious theologically. Mm -hmm. But you know, the Calvinist position would be to affirm the real presence. We would just not affirm a uh, ex opero opere understanding of it, nor the continuous sacrifice that the Roman Church does. But again, like I'm not even. I I literally have a book on my desk that is purely just about. The development of these doctrines and i mean i i have some grasp of it but you know even the roman catholic position i don't totally understand 
So we'll just touch on that briefly. Right, right. I'm, I'm not trying to get into theological grounds here, being as this is a more historical overview rather than a theological one. I was just trying to uh, trying to clarify that just for my own sake. Mm. Well, well, and the kind of um, offshoot of this is that it actually becomes the the climax of the spiritual life for many Scottish Protestants is participating in the Lord's Supper because they're having union with Christ and it's they're experiencing it. And you often find accounts of people uh, trembling and weeping profusely or being ravished by, by the presence of God in this, in this sacrament. So um, that's, a, that is very much at the heart of um, the reformed church at this point. But if we move on, uh, just pass over the next slide to the, the following one, please. So you'll see, this is the image at the center of the plate we've just passed. And this brings us to two or a couple of significant developments which take place in the 17th century. Um, because as we've alluded to at this point, there's a common Calvinist theology and piety within Scotland. But the main dividing lines are ecclesiological, Presbyterian and Episcopalian. And what you find is when James VI becomes King James I of England in 1603, well, there's a, there's a whole number of political ramifications of that, not least because there's no longer a Scottish court, but also he is in a position of power over the church in Scotland that he didn't have before, insofar as he has distance. They can't come to him and confront him in his chamber, as many ministers used to. He can't be um, the subject of uh, sermons in St. Giles Cathedral, uh, which we've been seeing on the television recently with the Queen's uh, death. He has distance, and so he can start implementing policies which draw the church, and this was, these were his words, into conformity with the Church of England, which is Episcopalian, but then also in its liturgy. So he reintroduces bishops in, is it, 16, is it 1610? I think he reintroduces bishops into Scotland. And then in the mid uh, 1610s, he starts a program of reforming the liturgy. And quite a number of the commissioners of the General Assembly are on board with this. So there's a, a revision to the, the form of prayers, updating it in various ways. But real controversy strip, strikes in 1618 with the five articles of Perth, so-called because that's where the General Assembly was being held. Think, think again, that's where John Knox preached his sermon in Perth. So there's a we were talking about poetry, it's right, it's coming back round. The five articles of Perth made essentially five decisions. One was kneeling at communion. Uh, baptism could be performed at home, as could communion for the sick. Confirmation by bishops and the reintroduction of various uh, festivals like Easter and Christmas. Now, and, and you will see, for example, with that, because those weren't in the Bible, they were had been rejected by the regulatory principle that James is introducing these matters of uh, adiaphora. But the real issue was kneeling. That's what got a number of Scottish Protestants upset, a considerable size, so much so that some were deposed from their ministry, some were imprisoned, but many uh, took the opportunity to go to Ulster because the Church of Ireland at this time was had a shortage of ministers and in in this drive to establish protestantism within within ireland and attack gallic culture to and and james was a big proponent of this they were quite willing to have these kind of hardcore presbyterians who didn't who refused to kneel at communion um working within the within the ulster region so you find a lot of Scottish Presbyterians who refuse to go off to Ireland and take part in what's known as the Six Mile Water Revival, where you get thousands of people attending churches for the Lord's Supper, um, often in open air fields and such like, uh, and doing it in the Presbyterian form of around the table. And these, these are, I believe, the ancestors of those who will later be in the Great Awakening. So there's a very interesting connection there. 
with the yeah, American that's, context. That's a wonderful connection there that I hadn't heard of. And that was the Six Mile Water Revival is what you called it? That's right, yeah. Alrighty. Cool. That's uh, something for me to explore later. And that ties in very neatly with uh, America because <clears throat> this uh, this man, Francis Make Me, is, uh, he is given the title the father of American Presbyterianism. And he's one of these guys, you know, went over to Ulster and then decides to come to America. So we'll touch on that. I don't know how much le uh, left you have, uh, Nathan. I don't want to. I'm getting towards the end here. here. So, so, so I'll we'll let you finish. Super, because we're, we're not too far from the end of my slides here. So um, James realizes that... Uh, this has caused too much controversy, so he, he he doesn't enforce it strictly. He allows Presbyterians to celebrate communion in the pres in the kind of uh, the way they had been, while some places kneel. Charles the first gets onto the throne, and uh, this plate comes from his coronation in Scotland, which was in 1633. So a whole eight years after he had actually become king which maybe tells you something about his kids, his interest in Scotland during this period. Um, but you can see he wants to emphasize kneeling at communion. He wants to in, enforce the five articles of Perth. And so there's a new wave of deposing dissenters from this and really making sure bishops, and he's supported by quite a few bishops who are who are not Calvinist. These ones are, are much more in the Arminian and Laudian William Lord's camp. If you could give a brief overview, what what's the difference there? Arminians and Calvinists. Uh, how do? What's the basic thing that they differ on for people that don't know? Um, the basic question is for well for Arminians, the what saves you is your your choice to believe in Christ. I, that I know that somebody might dispute that, but I th I think that's a one way of putting it. Whereas for Calvinists, you are elected to salvation and faith is the means by which God delivers that salvation to you. But would you say that's a fair, fair reflection? Having been a Baptist for a still a majority of my life, uh, you know, they would just directly say it is your choice to believe. Right. So even if it is a misconception of the actual theology, it's what's taught on the ground. So uh, unless Mr. Brooks has a uh, has an objection, no, I have, I have nothing to add. That's that's correct. Alrighty, so few few. So <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, these these guys are pushing that, but then also in sixteenth in the the sixteen thirties, Charles decides we're going to implement real conformity between the Church of Scotland and the Church of England, and they develop what's known as the Scottish Book of Common Prayer. This is a very lightly revised version of the English Book of Common Prayer, but essentially it is to become the new liturgy for the church in Scotland. And the Book of Common Prayer, uh, as we alluded to earlier, it's much more this set form of uh, call and response. There's actually set words for the minister to say and for the congregation to say. Uh, he also expects sermons to be written down that we are going to use a new Psalter, largely inspired by the English context. And um, so you have a very different form of worship that mo than most people are used to being implemented into, into Scotland. And I mean, ra rather stupidly, I think, Charles allowed drafts of the... the um, Book of Common Prayer to circulate in Scotland well before its introduction. So this gave the opponents of it plenty of time to uh, mount their opposition and attacks to it before it had even been introduced. And that's a deliberate decision on his part? Um, I'm not, I can't say for sure. I can't say for okay. sure, but he certainly, right. certainly these are, are being circulated. And they, they essentially say this is going to draw us towards Catholicism. We're going to become essentially a Catholic nation if we have this Book of Common Prayer. Or at least, or maybe the more moderates would say this is a step towards it. So you have 
1637, in St. Giles Cathedral, this prayer book gets read out for the first time. And during the service, there is a riot. People start throwing stools and stones and sticks at the, the minister who's reading this. Uh, so much so that uh, in on another occasion, he had a revolver on his pulpit just to make sure nobody would throw anything at him next time. Um, and this starts uh, what could be seen as a petitioning period where a number of uh, nobles and clergy are sending petitions to Charles to say, you've got to withdraw this, we don't want it. it the nobles, um, there was various other reasons as well, um, such as um, Charles had... Um, Oh, what was it called? The Revocation Act in 1625, where he had basically a lot. A lot of the land uh, in Scotland was actually royal land given to various nobles and lairds. In 1625, Charles just revoked all of these gifts of land and then redistributed them. So suddenly, just overnight, people uh, certain nobles lost land from the king that they previously had. Right, and this had uh, happened before in Scottish history, if I remember correctly. What was the the Douglas family or something like that? Uh, you know, yeah, that very... ties very well back into the whole mm. uh, Robert the Bruce saga, because that was uh, Douglas's whole thing was fighting with Robert the Bruce to regain his ancestral lands that had just right. been taken from him. So, uh, but but yes, this is a uh, this seems like a pattern in Scottish history, but maybe that's just a. Uh, quick conclusion that's faulty on my part we'll find out but uh anyways continue please mr hood so this petitioning process was quite common in scottish uh courtly politics certainly during the reign of james the sixth when he was in scotland that you would go to the king and uh, you might even have an aggressive response to the king you might even uh declare rebellion against him but the king will will forgive you and maybe give you some concessions. It's not seen as a matter of treason as much as this is just how you do politics in Scotland. But Charles doesn't really get that. And he's, he, very, he escalates things at one point by essentially saying, if you stick with this petitioning, you will be liable of treason and you'll be executed. So he takes things to a degree that isn't really known in Scotland. And so the petitioners their kind of faction, um, including uh, really significant nobles like the Earl of Argyll, they move to a new tactic, which is to essentially get public support. And this is, if we move to the final slide, what produces the National Covenant, which was co-authored by Alexander Henderson, who was a minister in Fife, uh, in somewhere near St. Andrews. And Archibald Johnston of Warriston, who, if you ever get the chance to read his diary, which is available online, I'd recommend just read a few pages. It's wild. It's wild. Um, but he, they, they produce this document, which essentially affirms allegiance to, well, it, it, it's like the covenant idea we've been speaking about, the bonding practice of all of those who swear it promise to uphold true religion in Scotland and remove the innovations of the prayer book. Crucially, not the five articles of Perth, because they want as broad a coalition as possible in support of removing the prayer book and the influence of the king on religion. But it also affirms that we will uphold the monarch, that we will not seek rebellion against him. We're actually doing this because, well, it's implied his advisors have led him astray. And this relates to what we talked about earlier about how in Scotland, the issue was never about rebellion or overthrowing a king, but rather getting the king not to interfere in the in church politics and to allow for tr what they would call true religion to be instantiated. It's also a great way of tr avoiding the accusation that you're all treasonous. But this, this um, gets read out in Greyfriars Churchyard in Edinburgh on the 28th of February 1638, with many nobles and then the next day clergy signing up to it. It's then read out in parishes across the country. And the responses of many congregations are quite powerful. 
what at the moment of swearing so people will and they're, they're often framed in an old testament way like re, they'll read out a passage where solomon renews the covenant or nehemiah and then they come to the act of swearing and eyewitnesses talk about people falling down in tears and groans and in their thousands in response to this and this is not just one or two cases but parishes all across scotland apart from aberdeen which was a center of royalist loyalty during this period so we see that this then gets a lot of support um this document and really becomes the bedrock of the next um of of the issues going forward and in just before we come to the bishops wars the the general assembly hadn't met for 20 or so years after the five articles of Perth, the king and the bishops had basically taken control. With, with the National Covenant, there's a new General Assembly called in the December. The king, as a concession, permits this. He wants to try and win the Covenanters back on side. And they basically undo the Scottish Book of Common Prayer. They also undo the five articles of Perth. They, they um, expel the bishops and return it in their view, to the true form of Presbyterianism. So this is the moment where um, Episcopalian and Presbyterianism comes out into open conflict, and the Presbyterians at this point are winning. Um, and they will do for 20 years until Charles II comes on the throne. So this uh, this one assembly basically just undoes all the attempts that were being made by the king to uh, bring together the Church of England and the Church of Scotland? Essentially, yes. Okay, yes. well, that's impressive. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> typically in these things, you don't see just a full uh, repudiation. Uh, that's a uh, that's noteworthy. So, but it, it's it, just just to just to comment on that though. It's it's interesting that the national covenant itself does not promise these things because they wanted to try and get as many sections of society on board with it as possible. Right. So the it doesn't say we'll get rid of the five articles of Perth or the bishops. But when they have the power, the people in charge of this then say, oh, it implies this. It means this really. <laughs> right. So that's, it's, it's a very clever little political tool, that. <laughs> yeah, so politically, yeah. they were perfectly fine with this. But as soon as they have like the majority to do something or the mandate, they just get rid of it. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Very and yeah, that's what I've got. That's what I've got. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Hood. I very thoroughly enjoyed that. And, uh, you know, I actually now know what was happening on the ground. That's uh, that's always good in history because it is very easy uh, in historical knowledge uh, to go either completely to one side and just complete only know narratives and sort of like the, uh, you know, the top down look at society. This is generally what happened as a storybook or mm -hmm. to just completely, you know, tunnel vision yourself and only know you know, dates, times, and specific actions, and none of the narrative behind it. So I, uh, I appreciate the uh, getting both here. You can you can also see as well just how things happening on a Sunday morning are actually influencing national politics and vice versa, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a uh, dare I say that's the ideal way of a uh, of a uh, societal organization. Uh, <laughs> things happening on Sunday making a difference in people's lives. That's a uh, quaint idea so um with that um i believe we're up to unless uh mr brooks if you had anything to fill in there and the uh in sort of like the uh ledger lines um well before we sign off here i know we're at like the three and a half hour mark i do <laughs> briefly want to go into very very <clears throat> lightly touching on Presbyterian influence in colonial America. Well, there's actually, a few things. Go ahead. I have, I have a proposition to you all. If there's a Saturday where we could all get together again, we could uh, just carry on from here into the actual colonial part. Even if it's a shorter stream or something, it might be a, you know, we wouldn't be just trying to cram everything into the end. Yeah, you know, we could do it properly. Well, there's probably not enough for a proper stream. So I can yeah. honestly. I'll just skip over everything. I'll leave you with like a, a little bit of an anecdote to uh, wet your palate on it. And that is during the American Revolution, King George had a loyalist advisor by the name of William Jones. 
And William Jones in 1776, writing of the American Revolution, says, quote, this has been a Presbyterian war from the beginning. Interesting. So that, it was that burned into the uh, sort of English consciousness, like the Presbyterians are out to get us. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I, I'm sure, for those that don't know, could you speak to the Presbyterian influence on the American revolutionaries? Because uh, you and I have uh, clashed beforehand over you know, how Christian the revolutionaries were. Uh, but there is an undeniable Presbyterian influence uh, that, you know, I would be stupid to deny. So, yeah. And this this is something that, you know, the American, the revolutionaries, Presbyterianism is probably the religion, arguably, other than uh, some Episcopalianism in the South that that the American Revolution is associated with. And that's because in America, Presbyterianism has a extremely Republican character. I mean, there's already sort of a Republican character that you had back in the old country, but in the American context, this is like much more so. And in terms of both uh, the signers of the Declaration and our presidents, if you take Episcopalians and Presbyterians together, it's like a two-thirds majority in both right. parties. Right. Um. Right, and you mentioned that Republican tradition there. Uh, I think I saw someone in chat mention, I forget who at this point, it was a while ago, before William will go over Super Chat, so I might see it uh, between one or two. Um, but I remember uh, the Scottish reformers, I believe it was Knox himself, uh, wrote against the abomination of having female monarchs. Yes, uh, this is a very controversial point. Knox was kind of to be completely honest with you, really a jerk to Mary, Queen of Scots. There were multiple times that he made her cry in his preaching to her. Uh, but yes, he wrote uh, a pretty famous book on the monstrous rule of women. Right, okay. And would this have any influence on republicanism? Yes. Knox's character... I mean, you could really, Knox didn't get everything he wanted out of the Scottish Reformation. He is a much more radical figure than I would say Scottish Presbyterianism as a general rule is. And I would say American Presbyterianism is in some ways much closer to what he would have uh, gotten without resistance than Scottish Presbyterianism was, for, for better or worse, because it's not a totally good thing, but you know, the the American Presbyterians would have been very, very taken with Knox. And a lot of like both his life story and the whole character of it were very, very influential in America. I see. All right. And let me see that sort of this is how you can, I guess, get Presbyterians uh, just skipping ahead just a little bit to make a point. Uh, whenever the South secedes, you see a strong Presbyterian influence on both halves, which is uh, typically what you'll see is like a denominational split or something like that, and it had been there for a while. But Presbyterianism, uh, either due to its decentralized nature or something like that, you get prominent Presbyterians on either side, which um, obviously makes me consider perhaps we can go back uh, back to earlier in American history uh, sort of see where this, uh, where these influences come from, uh, which is uh, the intention here. However, I think we're all probably either run out or about to run out of time. Uh, so I will probably try to set up like a part two stream just because I feel like there's more to explore here, even if it's not the uh, not the coveted four hour long stream that it, uh, some of its predecessors could be. Um, <laughs> Uh, does anyone have any final remarks to make? Any Anything we should discuss? Like, I'm not closing this down just yet. Like, do we miss a topic that we should be talking about? Well, just, just maybe for next time, then. Uh, I think touching on the Westminster Assembly, which definitely has its roots in Scottish Presbyterianism, would be really important, especially as that has an influence on American Presbyterianism too, right? So, right. Uh, I, I think that would be a, a good thing to to look at. All right. Um, yeah, I think if we did a second stream, it would be great to start with uh, the Westminster Assembly and the English Civil War, mm -hmm. and then go from there to America. 
All righty. And uh, Mr. Hat, is there any anything else you would like to discuss? Because, you know, like I said, we're not quite uh, quite wrapped up yet. So if there's like a topic that we could discuss, then by all means. Um, no, not really to add. Um, I've been listening quite intently to everything. A lot of this is, is quite quite new to me. Um, really, I, I don't have, I don't really have much to add on that. All righty. So, um, in that case, on a future stream, we will start with Westminster, and we will go to the influence on the American colonies. Something that I want to do is this large series of streams, uh, basically tracing um, American colonial heritage, customs, religion, uh, and all this other stuff in the modern day back to the colonies, and then from the colonies back to the Isle of Britain. So, uh, obviously. Scottish Reformation has quite a lot of impact on the United States in the modern day and in the colonial period, and I knew nothing about it, which was quite disgraceful. Uh, so that's partly why I first uh, start, uh, decided to do this. And then, you know, we had Charles III uh, ascend to the throne, offer to, uh, or not offer, swear to uphold the Protestant religion of Scotland, you know, fits well with current events. So that was the, uh, that was the uh, context for having the stream and the future one that will come afterwards. We will uh, get that sorted up. Um, if we can't all make it for next Saturday, then we'll just wait for the topic until the four of us can make it again, provided everyone is still interested, of course. Uh, with that, uh, does anyone have any? Uh, we'll do last remarks, shills, all this other stuff, uh, whatever anyone wants to say in their sort of closing. Uh, Mr. Brooks, we will start with you, since I believe that we uh, ended on you in the opening. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, just been a pleasure being here. Really enjoyed it. Uh, I can be found on my Substack, which I believe is linked in the description. That's mostly just kind of whatever strikes my fancy. Um, this reformation that happens in Scotland is really, I would say, very, it's very both instructive, and I think it is one of the most poetic stories of the Reformation in Europe. I think it has such rich material to study that I would highly encourage any of you, if you're interested in what you've heard here, to look into it further. There's just more and more of these, uh, so many externalities to these stories that come from it. it. It really is an incredible thing. And of course, you know, being a Presbyterian myself, I will say that uh, I highly recommend Presbyterianism as a particular flavor of Calvinist Protestantism, but uh, we'll leave it there. And uh, Mr. Hood, uh, your works, final remarks, uh, whatever you would like to uh, speak about. Well, first, thank you for having me on. I've really enjoyed it and I've, I've learned a lot about the, the Scottish Reformation. Uh, ju just in terms of shilling, I've got my YouTube channel and I'm going to be regularly streaming on Tuesdays, 7 till 9 uh, GMT. Uh, and this Tuesday, I'm delighted to be joined by Rupert August and Daughter of Albion. We're going to be discussing English restoration. So those of you who were at the Witten uh, will have heard a lot about this already, and we're going to be sharing some of these ideas uh, there. So tune in then. Mr. Hat? Um, nothing to show as, as of, as such. Um, uh... No, I will just say thank you for um, having me on once again, and thank you to Mr. Brooks and Mr. Hood um, for their wonderful presentations. Um, I apologize I couldn't be more more kind of involved this stream, uh, but it really was kind of outside my remit, and it's far far better to just have me sit, sit in the background than to uh, sort of interject without without sufficient knowledge. So, uh, yes, th thank you very much to everybody, and uh, thanks everyone for watching. So, uh, with that being said, you can find uh, in the description, uh, we have uh, Mr. Hood's and Mr. Hat's uh, Find My Friends, where it has all their links where you can go find them. And uh, Grant Brooks's uh, Telegram, or not Telegram, it was a substack that I linked in the description, uh, where he writes about various different historical and religious subjects. I believe he had a commentary on was it Acts or Romans. Uh, I just did the one on Romans 13. Yeah, okay. So, commentary on scripture. Uh, he had a very wonderful essay that he wrote on the two different paths of Protestantism, that is a uh, Reformed uh, Catholic and a uh, Restorationist. I highly recommend you go uh, check that out. I shared it on my Telegram whenever, we, uh, whenever I first came across it. And with that being said, before we sign off, uh, we will go over the Super Chats, uh, which you know, shouldn't take too terribly long. Our first one 
uh, from Prince of Parma for 14 South African Rand. Uh, the geese are coming home to roost. Uh, very wonderful. Very good. Very good. <laughs> uh, we have uh, Maddie Gee uh, for five dollars. Thanks for the stream and great job on Twitter last night. I uh, wish that we weren't arguing over uh, theological topics on I'm, Twitter. I'm amazed that. we got this far without talking about the recent shenanigans uh, <laughs> going about the place. But, yeah. uh, I, I would. I yeah. I'm not gonna go on. To, I would want. Yeah, to yeah, let's, let's, not, let's not do it now. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, you, you, it's public. You can go and uh, catch up on it if it really is that terribly interesting to you. Uh, for 35 more, South African Rand, Prince of Parma, the Knox Lennon Pipeline confirmed. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, uh, once again, I just ever so feel slightly bad uh, for bringing that connection up because there is a lot of abuse and right wing thought, you know, connecting Calvinism directly to communism or revolutionary. Well, I was going to about to ask: Is this something we, we could do a, a stream on? Because I've heard lots of people discuss certain forms of radical Protestantism as a, an indirect precursor, at least in rhetoric, to right. the, the certain mm -hmm. agrarian and Marxist forms of thought uh, that would occur la later on. You know, with the whole the whole idea of uh, uh, making everybody equal and reducing reducing wealth and property and the idea of the, the sort of the chosen kingdoms and such. Uh, right. If we do that, I am going to basically govern that conversation as a neutral arbiter like I did with the Red Hawk stream on the cigar, on the AA cigar stream. Okay. Uh, and we will get uh, people that are willing to respectfully uh, argue that, uh, Pamela, I'm sure you would be on the uh, Catholic side because I have yet well, I to would, be I a... Uh, I have yet to see a discussion where a Protestant has come away feeling so terribly it's, disrespected it's, by you. <laughs> it's, it's 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 one of the things that I um I I haven't really made up my mind on. So what I would like to do if we were going to do that is basically put out a flyer, uh, you know, in 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 the metaphorical sense, saying we want speakers to come and and discuss. Uh, this house believes that Protestantism is the precursor to <laughs> radical. Uh, socialist and agrarian rhetoric, basically, and then yeah, uh, and then the other one would be, yeah, yeah, basically, and then we would have you know two two sides to that. So I I would like to organize it like a formal debate, uh, right? Basically, um, right. maybe maybe two people on each side or just one one on one. I don't really know, but uh, yeah. so yeah, that that could be very good, and it would do justice to the topic rather than uh, you know having streams whinging on one or the other, which is what usually happens on that topic, mm. much to my annoyance. Um, also, we have Prince of Parma for 70 South African Ren, St. Bar Bartholomew's slash Huguenot stream win. Yes, uh, yes. This that, would be, that would be very good. It will be highly controversial. So, yes. uh, yeah, we will have to, I will carefully plan that one out. Um, you know, it I, is, I, um, I, 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 I know I said I didn't have anything to add to today's, today's stuff, but I, I have to say, it is interesting how in somewhere like Scotland, the Catholic Church seems to collapse instantaneously, on, almost in one swoop. It just sort of dies, um, and and the Reformation seems to succeed, and then it sort of it, it becomes a it becomes a kind of persecuted faith in the Highlands for a while. Um, but it's interesting you see you know how how it varies all over the place. Where you have somewhere so some somewhere like the, those regions of, of France where you know um, Protestantism and, and the Reformation sort of sweep in and then are quite quickly swept out again. Um, you know, it's 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 interesting how the how the texture of these sorts of things is different all over the place. Right, and that was a uh, kind of why I was emphasizing the differences between the Scottish Reformation and the other continental episodes is just because it's so different, as you were describing. Would and, it be well, and the Huguenots are fascinating too. They have a lot of influence both in England, uh, in Geneva, and you know, more generally, particularly on Calvinism. I mean. Right. You know, Calvin himself is a Huguenot. Right. Yeah. It's um it's would it be fair to say, based on what we've learned today, that perhaps while Christianity was strong in Scotland, the Catholic Church never really was in the same way that it existed in somewhere like France or Italy. Um, I, I think that's pretty apparently true. I mean I think yeah. and I think that's pretty easily traceable to 
the longstanding like royalist for lack of a better description rating of the church like there wasn't much of a church left to oppose the reformers no. and the lords of congregation and what was left was pretty corrupt and and sort of in, in a pretty poor shape anyway um right you know, it yeah well, and then even the fact they only got an archbishop, what, uh, 50 years or so before yeah. the Reformation? Yeah, like 70 years before uh, <laughs> before the Reform Parliament. Mm. Yeah, just think, you could have uh, you could have lived to see the first archbishop installed in Scotland and uh, died right after the uh, Scottish Parliament decided yeah. that it's no longer necessary. <laughs> you could have done. You could have done. Uh, and finally, uh, we have Cringe Walker here with $10.00. Say Christ is Lord. The Shia test must become standard Christian friend enemy distinction. Uh, right. Well, French Walker, Christ is, is Lord. This? What is this a reference to? Yes, of course, Christ is Lord. <laughs> Christ is Lord. That's the, uh, Christ is Lord. Uh, <laughs> Shia test. I don't know. Well, I don't know what specifically started it, but I saw a lot of people online basically going to certain subversive elements saying, "Say Christ is Lord," and then they. <laughs> well, it's a very old. Uh, it's the witch test, right? This is a right, thing it that's is. been around for a long time, actually. Yeah, yeah, but you know, why is it happening now? I don't really know the exact origin. We're surrounded by witches. That's why. <laughs> very oh, fair. I mean, of... no lie detected. Yeah. <laughs> speaking of which, we didn't get into Scottish witch hunting. And you surely know? we need to do that for Presbyterianism, I mean, right? That's, 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 next that's, do. that's a whole other thing, isn't it? The whole history of Scots, witch hunts, and folkloric uh, influences. Uh, you know, next time, if we're going to go more into the uh, influencing America and Ulster and all this other stuff, uh, if we're going to do that more on the next stream rather than background, uh, that sounds like the perfect opportunity to have a long uh, foray into Scottish witch hunts. Also, uh, again, I'm so sorry to keep bringing. We're trying to end the stream, and I keep bringing up new things here. But well, no, I um, specifically put the super chats at the end rather than the show, so that uh, you know people um, have an incentive to stay. The the incident with Knox in the galleys, where he throws the icon of the Virgin Mary out of the out of the ship and into the water. Um, what sort of where in so so where does the kind of anti Mary side of reformation ideologies come from because i noticed that like something like the scottish church or kirk came about fairly independently of you know sort of mainstream lutheranism and kind of sort of european um european re re reformationist movements but they all have this common repudiation of the virgin mary in some way e even even if it's not a total repudiation there's still a there's still a repudiation of kind of uh, Marianism as such. What, why was that such a common element to all the all the all the, all the Reformationists all over the place? It ties back in with the whole, uh, you know, the whole deal about images and veneration and all this stuff. The, you know, the Reformation and the Calvinist strain of it, particularly, takes strenuous issue with uh, the Declaration of the. I believe uh, second Nicene Council, where they say that anyone who does not hold the veneration of images to be an apostolic doctrine, let him be anathema. You know, the, the reformers take enormous issue with that. And the, the, particular, the particularity of Mary is because uh, the Marian devotion was like, not quite like everything, but it was a huge linchpin of this idea of icons and venerations and such and i mean from knox or calvin's perspective what you're doing is giving to someone else things that belong only to christ and right. would object very strongly to that and then there is a uh, sort of uh, reformed uh, lutheran divide here because the lutherans uh, for like the first few generations of it existing uh, especially after luther dies uh, there was no coherent doctrine on this uh, there's a lot of people that say that uh, Luther held to a few Marian dogmas, obviously not the intercession, all this other stuff that was mentioned in the uh, Augsburg Confession, but things like the uh, perpetual virginity and uh, things along those lines. Uh, I believe, uh, I think the story is that Luther held it to his death, and then, you know, his con some of his contemporaries held the opposite view, um, and there's still no formal declaration today. So there is a... Uh, just because of where the two different uh, Protestant branches focus on their theology, uh, you get the split regarding Mary. So, 
that's why the Lutherans tend to look much more Catholic when they talk about Mary with all the different titles and all the different theological significances because there is no um, there is no absolute prohibition on icons and images mm -hmm. as you uh, at least in the under not in the understanding that you see with the Reformed Christians. So right. so there is a split there. Thank you very much for clearing that up. Uh, so something, something, that I, something that occurs to me quite quite late on. So, and uh, one last thing, uh, we have Cringe Walker here for two dollars saying check uh, check my Twitter DMs for an example. And I don't know how well this is going to show on stream. I will at least attempt so that we can say I tried. Um, we have uh, him going around to various different subversive figures, uh, telling them say Christ is Lord, and they all reply nope, no, and no. Uh, so impossible to see here, but in various ones of these, he goes to like uh, someone posted in the world full of Florida, B Massachusetts. He basically says, say that Christ is Lord, and they reply, no. Someone replies in all caps, nope. So uh, seems like a very good witch test in the modern day, if I'm to be perfectly honest. Yeah. <laughs> so with that being said, we've now got our uh, new witch test for the modern era. Uh, we now know the background of the Scottish Reformation, and uh, the, the stage is set for us to start discussing its effects on the wider world um, and, you know, carry out witch tests just as our uh, ancestors would have uh, been proud of us to do. So <laughs> with that being said, thank you all for joining me, uh, and I will uh, hopefully see you all very soon. Good afternoon, fellas. Goodbye, everybody. Cheerio. Have a good day, everyone.